Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the City Auditorium, University of Health and Allied Sciences, for this very important and exciting conference. It is good to see you all, and I can see in the room quite a number of dignitaries from various backgrounds, and we'll be introducing them uh, very soon. But um, before we go on, I think it's in order that we say a word of prayer. So let us pray. Father, we want to thank you for today. We thank you for this gathering, and we thank you for the topic that we are here to discuss. This is a conference. It is supposed to educate us. It is supposed to expose us to areas that we may not be very familiar with, and also to help create awareness and for advocacy for a very important topic. As we gather, we ask that you will lead us from beginning to end, and that in the end, we can all say it has been a success and that you have been the reason for it. We grant you 
our our great our our praises and we worship you lord as we uh, start our session in the name of jesus we pray amen so my name is paul amuna professor paul amuna i'm the dean of the school of public health university of health and allied sciences and with me today to moderate this session I have with me. I'm Maria Moku Coleman. I'm a research fellow from the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research, University of Ghana, and a member of the Sports Project, which is partnering APEC Ghana in this conference. Thank you. All right. So, thank you. So we we hope that um, we will help to steer this uh, conference. Uh, we have a very busy packed schedule and uh, uh, we have started uh, a bit late uh, but i hope that we'll be able to um to make up time as we go along and uh, so just to um give us some overview of the program for today uh, the theme of this conference is research, policy, and religion. The potential role of multisectoral collaboration to improve outcomes of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. And as you can see from the theme, this is very broad, and that is a reflection of the um, extent of the importance of uh, preeclampsia um, as a condition or hypertensive disorders uh, of pregnancy and how they affect us as a society and how they affect uh, women. Uh, so uh, in our lineup, we have uh, a number of sessions and I want to believe that we all have a copy of the program booklet. Uh, but um, there are some adjustments that we are making to the program. But I just want to summarize uh, what uh, we, we have. Uh, we will have some uh, uh, goodwill messages uh, from various uh, people, uh, both here and some um, uh, uh, video recorded uh, for us from various uh, important stakeholders. Uh, and then we will follow that with um, a musical interlude uh, on and screening documentary uh, trailer. And then we'll have our guest speaker, uh, His Lordship Justice George Boedi, and then our keynote speaker, Professor Evelyn uh, Koko Ansa, who will be presenting to us. Um, and then we will not actually have a break at that stage. Uh, as, as uh, indicated in the program. We will continue from there straight to session one of uh, our uh, short presentations. There will be short scientific presentations on the management of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy in Ghana. The first part will be on updates and ongoing research. And the second part will be on the role of policy and religion in the management. And then if you look in your booklet, you have to turn to page six for the continuation of the second part of the uh, program, um, which uh, continues. Uh, and then um, at that uh, stage, uh, we, will, we will have um, our next session, which will be uh, the panel discussion. We're going to have a panel discussion uh, to be exciting. We have a number of experts and we're going to call them up to stage. Um, I think we will have our break after we finished with the uh, session one of the, uh, the short presentations. And at that time, we will also have a group, a number of group photographs uh, to capture the conference. So that is the lineup here. Uh, 
Can I just take an uh, opportunity at this time to acknowledge uh, a few uh, important dignitaries who are with us here today? Um, I know that uh, His Lordship uh, George Bwedi is here. He is a supervising High Court judge for Ho and OT regions. Um, and as others come in, we'll acknowledge them. Some of our dignitaries here are speakers, so we don't want to acknowledge them just yet. I also want to bring to your attention the fact that this conference has over 350 registered participants, uh, and there are many participants who have joined us online. So all those of you who have joined us online, we want to welcome you to the conference, and we hope that you stay with us throughout and enjoy the session. I think it's in order for us to also acknowledge the various sponsors and partners for this conference at this stage. We will do so again towards the end, but we want to in particular recognize SPOT, uh, ENCORD, APEC, of course, this is an APEC conference, the action for on uh, preeclampsia, uh, the Ghana chapter. So we acknowledge all of you, uh, the Ghana Medical and Dental Council, the Ministry of Health, uh, the Greater Accra Regional Hospital, uh, the Ghana Health Service. Uh, we have the Nursing and Midwifery uh, Council, and of course, the University of Health and Allied Sciences, who are the hosts. So we thank you all for partnering uh, with the APEC team to get this conference underway. So at this juncture, I will hand over to Mary to continue, thank you. Okay, so without much ado, I just want to say that we are here for the Ghanaian woman, the African woman, to make sure that when she goes through pregnancy, she does not lose her life or her life does not become at risk because of eclampsia and preeclampsia. We see this in the clinics, but today we are going to look at how collaboration outside the clinics would help to improve the outcomes of preeclampsia and eclampsia. Without much ado, I'd like to invite Ms. Rosemary Agbefu, who is Assistant Registrar of the Institute of Traditional and Alternative Medicine to introduce our chairperson for today's occasion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc. Once again, a very good morning to you all, our distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure for me to stand before you this morning to introduce the chairperson of today's program. Our distinguished chairperson had a secondary school education at the Keta Secondary School in the Bishop Herman College, where he obtained his O and A level certificates, respectively. A medical doctor by profession, he received his medical training at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in 1993. His medical career began at the Agogo Presbyterian Hospital in the Ashanti region. He also worked at the St. Teresa's Hospital in Nkranza. He dedicated himself fully to providing quality health service to all Ghanaians, especially in the districts where he worked and lived. In recognition of his dedicated service, the Catholic Diocese of Sunyani adjudged him the best diocesan doctor in 1999. He obtained a doctorate degree in public health from the prestigious London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in 2005. Our chairperson is also a renowned academic. After years of working in the hospital, he decided to go back to the classroom. His academic career began at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology as a lecturer in 2006. From 2012 to 2014, he was the head of the Department of Community Health of the School of Medical Sciences, and also the head of the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the School of Public Health from 2014 to 2016. He then proceeded to the University of Health and Allied Sciences, where we find ourselves today. As the Dean of the School of Medicine, 
from March 2016 to July 2021. He is currently the Pro Vice Chancellor of this university. Indeed, his work in the public health sector of this country is indelible, and many will agree that he is the right person to chair this occasion. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Professor Harry Kwame Chagbo, our chairperson for today. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Uh, no, I'm not speaking wrong. Good morning, everyone. I can see a lot of familiar faces. I can see the district directors of health somewhere there. You are all welcome. Distinguished speakers and participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to join you as chair of this symposium on the theme, research, policy, and religion, the potential of multisectoral collaboration to improve outcomes of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy in Ghana. It is being organized by Action of Preeclampsia Ghana in collaboration with many uh, others and is hosted by the University of Health and Allied Sciences to herald this year's World Preeclampsia Day celebration on May 22 which is just about two days away on Sunday. Hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are among the leading causes of maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality. For example, we know that about 10 in 100 pregnant women suffer preeclampsia, one, which is one of the disorders. And we know also that preeclampsia is a major cause of maternal deaths. And it is said that it accounts for about 16% of maternal deaths. It is also estimated that in every six minutes, a woman dies because of preeclampsia. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the bad news. But there is good news. And the good news is that when detected early, it can be managed safely and no lives will be lost. This is the good news. Action on preeclampsia is proclaiming worldwide. And they are working very hard to improve outcomes of women and babies through engaging, educating, and empowering women and healthcare professionals. This symposium is affording us the opportunity to engage, educate, and empower ourselves to ensure that we do not lose our mothers and babies to preeclampsia and related disorders. This symposium is a fourth of its kind, and it is an appropriate forum for experts in the field to create awareness, share new knowledge, and lead discussions on improving outcomes from hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. The theme, research, policy, and religion, the potential roles of multisectoral collaboration to improve outcomes of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, I believe has been carefully crafted to emphasize the importance of all stakeholders in helping to manage the disorders. The organizers have assembled 
distinguished personalities and professionals to lead the discussions and break down the issues for us to understand. The choice of University of Health and Allied Sciences to host this symposium is also significant because health professionals and their trainees need this information the most to guide their practice and the training they provide. I would encourage us all to participate fully in this all important symposium as we forge ahead to look for better ways in managing hypertensive disorders of pregnancy to make sure that our mothers and our babies live. Distinguished speakers, participants, ladies and gentlemen, with these remarks, I accept to chair this symposium and wish you all fruitful deliberations. Thank you very much. Okay, so now our host has welcome and accepted to chair this occasion. So we are in the right place and we are ready to continue with our deliberations. We have some solidarity messages coming in for us. Many people are supporting our cause and I would like to invite to the podium to give us the solidarity message on behalf of the Ministry of Health, the representative of the head of the family health division of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Chris Fofier. Please, let's welcome him with a round of applause. He will be followed by a video presentation of solidarity message from Marcus Green, who is the APEC representative from the UK. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you very much for inviting us here. It's a singular privilege really to be here. The Ghana Health Service over the years has recognized with deep concern the rising numbers of hypertensive disorders in the country. Despite all efforts that have been put in place, we realize that we appear to be overwhelmed from very low values or figures that we had about a decade ago. We now have hypertensive disorders coming as one of the leading causes of maternal mortality in the country. We also acknowledge that we cannot do it alone. We might need the support of different people with different discipline expertise that go beyond even the health sector. So it's coming as um, very refreshing to see the great work that APEC Ghana is doing because we believe that most of the challenges we have, the basis lie or underpinning factors are around knowledge and understanding about the disease. With this in mind, we are more than happy to say that whatever APEC Ghana intends to do in this area, we want to support and encourage APEC Ghana, invite all other partners to join so that together we can chart a new path and make sure that um, we can change terminologies like, say, safe motherhood, which is what we've been preaching for, and move to a new era where we can talk about privileged motherhood because our women will no longer be concerned about dying in childbirth, but enjoy it as an experience they can share with their families so that we all rejoice in that new experience. So on this note, on behalf of the director of the Family Health Division of the Ghana Health Service, I congratulate APEC Ghana for this initiative and we promise to continue to engage and support you in all your endeavors. Congratulations, APEC Ghana. Thank you. Video. Hello, my name is Marcus Green. I'm the Chief Executive of Action on Preeclampsia in the United Kingdom. We're one of the oldest organizations that uh, is there for patients. We run study days for midwives. We uh, are involved in a whole lot of research 
and we are involved in supporting patients throughout the UK. But one of our most important roles in recent years has been developing a new way of working, a way of working that uh, involves working with partners throughout the world. And a few years ago, Koiwa and the team came to me uh, and were talking about starting up action, action on preeclampsia in Ghana. And I look at the child that they created and I see now an organization which has grown into the teenager that is taller than you. I see an organization that is doing wonderful work and to see this fourth preeclampsia scientific symposium happening today is so wonderful. And I could not be more proud of what you are doing, and what you are achieving. You are doing remarkable work. And so Professor Tagbor, thank you so much for the invitation. And thank you to the whole of the team that have set up this conference today. I'm very much looking forward to hearing so many different voices and hearing what you are all up to. It's been a fantastic journey to see you over the last four years. But what we've learned in the last two years through coronavirus is that we can work collaboratively, we can work internationally, we can work with one another and we can learn from one another. And that is why I'm so excited about the future. I'm so excited about what you're doing. And I know that you are spreading your word throughout West Africa today. And I know that you've got people coming from all over the place to be with you. And I know that as a result of what you are doing, as a result of all that you have got going on, you will have better outcomes for women. And that is the most important thing. You're doing a remarkable job. I really am very proud to, to know you all. And maybe, maybe just next year, wouldn't it be lovely uh, if instead of talking to you via the wonderful communication methods we have, that I could be with you face to face. If I am able to, I will be there. But I just wanted to finish by saying you're doing an amazing job. You're doing a remarkable job. But what's most important is you are doing an important job. You are making a difference. You are saving lives. And you are creating wonderful, wonderful outcomes. So congratulations to you all. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you all very much. Thank you all very much for your messages. We are now going to show a short documentary. Let's watch, let's listen. Sometimes they are swollen and they think it's because they are going to have a boy. Sometimes because of all the symptoms that they have, some believe they are cursed. Somebody, some believe that other people don't want them to have their child. Let's watch the experiences of some women shortly and then we'll go on. Thank you. Documentary, please. For me, that is when I got to know that my wife was normal. When Henry rushed to the Confinochi Teaching Hospital and saw the lifeless body of her wife on a covered stretcher being wheeled to the mortuary. So they brought her the body on, on the stretcher, and I said yes. Now I know she is dead. What did you do when you saw the body? I didn't cry. Did you touch the body? I didn't touch the body. I just wanted to confirm that indeed she was dead. And I got the confirmation. In Accra, the nation's capital, preeclampsia kills more women than any other maternal health complication. Accra also records the highest number of maternal deaths in Ghana. That's according to the immediate past regional health director, Dr. Linda Van Otu. They go in to deliver with very high blood pressure levels. Some of them, when they are pregnant, before they became pregnant, they did not have blood pressure or hypertension. But through the pregnancy, you find that the blood pressure goes very high. So high that some of them can even fit. And then some of them, unfortunately, die. And once the baby is inside, when this happens, then the mother loses her life and the baby also loses his or her life. We have had blood pressure readings that are unimaginable. Like one of them went to as high as 300 over 180. And that is unimaginable. Koiwa Koila Biofosuapia survived this. She lives here in Accra with her husband and their only child. 
But for preeclampsia, she should have been a mother of three by now. She narrowly escaped death twice. I had attended Antonita for 27 good weeks, a whole first degree holder. I was as ignorant as anybody else. Even my mom, who had had it, couldn't, for whatever reasons, didn't tell me, even though I knew she had lost her babies. The nurses or whoever who saw whatever sign, because it just didn't start that night. Mm. I had had the symptoms, headaches, you get big or necessarily, but nobody said anything. And so it's ignorance that killed my baby. Mm. I'm lucky to have survived a cancer because it, it affects the brain. It just um, Some people just don't survive. And when they do, they are like, nothing, robots. Yes, she survived the first one, but the baby did not. She conceived again in 2013. This time I did my antenatal care for six months only in Ghana. And then I went to the States. Whilst I was doing antenatal care, I didn't get any symptom of fear. Well, when I got to the States, at 34 weeks, the symptoms started. And you see, the different there for whatever they did. They managed me until I was 38 weeks and then delivered to me a safe baby girl who is healthy today and is about four years. Mm. And I returned home, no complications. According to the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology of India, the risk that a woman in a developing country will die of preeclampsia or eclampsia is about 300 times that of a woman in a developed country. It appears the story of Kwewa confirms this research because there was a repeat in Ghana in 2017. One Saturday, I was just extremely tired. It was very unusual. And because of my history, we're always checking our pressure. So my husband was like, we should go and check my pressure at the hospital. He said uh, my pressure was 150-100. The GP said he has to detain me. I was like, oh, GP, you give me that to have plenty of drugs. I'll take it tomorrow morning, I'll come. Then he called the, my, the specialist and he said he should detain me. I was there for four days. They were doing the routine, checking fetal heartbeats you know, checking, doing, advising you to do kick counts and all that. And then on the fifth day, in the morning, the night nurse comes to check Peter Hardy's. Nothing. Matron comes around 11 o'clock, checks again. No beats. Then they call the doctor who comes now around 2 p.m. Confirms with the scan and says, I'm sorry, but... We lost him. So this time the baby did not even come out. He died in my room. Because of her previous surgeries, inducing her to have natural delivery didn't work. So she had to be cut again to remove a dead fetus out of her stomach. It is very rare for pregnant women to survive this because of how it strikes. These are real stories. These are real women who have gone through this. Kwewa is a missed uh, case, near miss, and we thank God for her life, and we thank her for what she's doing through Epic Ghana. It's now time to listen to our guest speaker. And our guest speaker is an ordained elder of the Church of Pentecost in Ghana. He's married with four children. He was called to the bar in 1992. And also he's been a legislator and a member of parliament from 1993 to 2001. He holds a master's of law degree from Fordham University Law School, New York, and University of Pretoria in South Africa. His Lordship Justice George Bwedi is our guest speaker this morning, and he's the Justice of the Superior Court of Judicature Ghana since, 20, since July 2010. He's also a judge at the High Court Second D. He's, he was a judge at the High Court Second D, and presently is the, is the is in Ho as a supervising judge, Volta Region 
and Uti region. Let's welcome him for his speech. Thank you very much. Uh, take note, I'm a guest. I'm not a speaker, I am a guest. I deem it as an honor, indeed, uh, as responsibility. Later, I learned it's a responsibility because of my past experiences as a legislator and indeed as an officer of the church. And indeed, as uh, somebody who give orders, who listen to people and advance their rights. A responsibility to be associated with you here in this symposium, as, as I said, guest of honor. This year's uh, APEC Ghana's fourth preclampsia scientific symposium had been themed, and I quote, research, policy, and religion, the potential ro role of multi sectoral collaboration to improve outcomes of high pretensive disorders of pregnancy, and of quote. APEC Ghana surely has been intentional in targeting and assembling skilled persons, that is healthcare professionals, religious leaders, I suppose there would be some religious leaders here, researchers, victim survivors, persons who are involved in one way or the other in the care of pregnant women and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and its related conditions. I have considered the mission statement, the theme of this year's APEC Ghana Symposium, as well as the skilled personnel that APEC Ghana has intentionally, as I said, invited as speakers on the forum's objectives. The speakers shall, by their knowledge and practice, I believe, leave no one in doubt in fulfilling the symposium's objectives. Among which I believe, believe, among which is one that I deem particularly as crucial ultimately in satisfying the vision of APEC Ghana. That is to, and I quote, identify research or knowledge gaps about multi-sectorial collaboration, end of quote. Surely some gaps need to be closed. Knowledge gaps duty and functional gaps, real multi-sectorial collaborative disconnects that typically are associated with how we seem to be working here in our part of the world. That reminds me of my mates of the 2002 human rights class of the University of Pretoria, Lulu Matakala, a Zambian, now a professor of law who runs an NGO in Kampala, Christian, and I quote, beyond research, end of quote. The question here is what happens beyond delivery of works of medical knowledge, research, and practice in the field of preeclampsia, eclampsia, and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. In addressing the forum's objective, that I have just above identified, I'm expecting. Indeed, I never heard people, I'm expecting to find representatives from the core state actors, the duty bearers in most of the things, most of these crucial maternal and health concerns. Indeed, I've heard Minister of Health and other allied agencies, I believe they are representing the, the executive somehow. And our advice next time, I pick Ghana to invite these state actors, Office of Parliament, I believe I said executive is here, and the judiciary, whose, I repeat, duty is not only to assist APEC Ghana, quote again, identify research or knowledge gaps about multisectorial collaboration, end of quote, but also to be actively seen, to be following or adhering to a health policy processes and mechanisms towards 
addressing this potentially dangerous pregnancy complication condition and in furtherance of fulfilling women's constitutional and human rights. Maternal mortality rates in Ghana, as you've heard just this morning, and other in Ghana and other sub Saharan Africa are strangely still high, reflecting the poor health care structures, services, and indeed overall access. I use the word strangely because most causes of maternal mortality, not unlike preeclampsia or eclampsia, are or could be preventable and treatable. I've had brief chat with the executive director of APEC Ghana, Mrs. Ofosuapia, regarding the genesis of her passion for this her chosen career path. For her and many other women who likely survived of this condition, I wish them God's blessings. But for many unlucky ones who did not survive pregnancy-related critical conditions, including my niece, Mary Donto, ironically a nurse at Chief of Prasso Government Hospital, who just yesterday lost her life in pregnancy-related health conditions at the regional hospital, Cape Coast. May I respectfully ask participants to rise to observe a minute silence in their commemorative honor. May we all help to reduce these occurrences. May we resume our seats. Thank you very much. I take cheerful notice of APEC Ghana in its earlier programs, which have identified how religion, traditional religion, cosmic practices, as well as spiritual and faith-based health prescriptions continue to act as challenges and hindrances to formal maternal health care and services. Presently, they do not appear to be stringent laws that regulate in particular the activities of faith-based spiritual, traditional, unorthodox religious groups and churches. Anyone who professes, anyone professes to speak and act in the name of God, prof professing all forms of maternal health advice and counseling, which most often are unscientific and permanently damaging and often fatal. They are, there are presently no specific laws in Ghana that regulate religious groups and churches activities as to who can prefer, lead, and provide pregnancy and other maternal health related counseling and prescription. No one doubts the contribution of mainstream churches and faith-based organizations to the spiritual and mental intelligence of the citizenry. However, considering the present near chaos and spiritual insanity around us and the damage, fatal and permanent injuries to the health and the life of the citizenry by some of these so-called religious groups, it's prudent, in my view, for the state now to face the bull by the horn and in line with what is happening in Rwanda, compel some form of sanity as to, quote, meeting a minimum required qualification for lead preachers of their sermons, end of quote. Spiritual guidance and leadership in counseling on a pregnancy maternal and other crucial health related matters. There is a need for health professionals to appreciate the sensitivity of cultural and religious beliefs and the needs of their patients. And I believe the Minister of Health is here and officers are here. It's very something quite sensitive and serious, but in the fulfillment of rights, I think you need to take this in serious. Customs 
and traditions die slowly. Therefore, the antidote must be education, education, and education, as is being the objective of this forum, and effective collaborative efforts with stakeholders, including state and non-state civil society actors, including APEC Ghana, APEC Ghana. Besides, effective communication and engagement of patients on their faith, customary and cultural beliefs on pregnancy and maternal health risk. In the light of the overriding, compelling, and legitimate public interest, consideration is the way to go. As it is now becoming the practice for the provision of secured private spaces and offices for lactating mothers to breastfeed their babies, it should not be difficult for health institutions to create adequate spaces for inpatients to meet their recognized and well-qualified spiritual leaders for the exercise of their religious and customary beliefs that do not appear contrary to scientifically endorsed and proven formal medication. They are, these are not easy choices. Neither are they politically correct paths to choose. However, I do recall 25 years ago, the challenges and how traditional herbal alternative medicine and health practices came to be recognized, accepted, and incorporated into mainstream public health service, ultimately by way of an enactment. Lastly, when it becomes there and the state does not appear to be offering the crucial collaboration, quote again, to reduce the unending fatal outcome of maternal and perinatal outcomes associated with hypertensive disorder pregnancy, and of course, as a core duty, the last resort shall be to the court. As it happened 20 years ago in the treatment action case against the Minister of Health. I believe it's a South African case. The, the officials and workers and personnel from the Ministry of Health, I believe, know this case. It's in South Africa. The suit was brought jointly by a number of civil society groups in South Africa, led by the Treatment Action Campaign, the main defense of the South African government. Not unlike most third world and developing countries like Ghana, was that of the hackneyed lack of resources. The court, not disregarding the state's main argument, that is lack of resources, nonetheless indicted the South African government over its failure to provide pregnant HIV positive women with the nevrapine drugs that could prevent the transmission of the virus to their, fair, their child during labor. The court issued a compelling order on the government, that is the South African government, to provide a scheduled laid out plan for the provision of the crucial drug, nevrapine, for the prevention of mother to child transmission of the virus. That is then an effective use of judicial power of an unelected arm of the state against the dominant elected arm aimed at an inference of enforcing the citizen's right to health provision. That is section 27 of the South African constitution. I wish APEC Ghana and all the conference participants a fulfilled deliberation. Thank you. Education, education, education. Engage and collaborate with all stakeholders. 
effective communication with these women, many of whom are just ignorant. And education, education will make a lot of difference in their lives through their pregnancy. Thank you very much, Your Lordship. We are very grateful. I would like to appreciate and acknowledge the presence of the director of the Institute of Health Research of UHAS, Professor Margaret Japon. Please, let's give it to her. We also have with her the university librarian, UHAS University librarian, Dr. Theresa Edu. Thank you so much for coming to support us. It's now time for us to listen to our keynote speaker. Our keynote speaker is the director of the Center for Malaria Research of the University of Health and Allied Sciences in Ghana, where we are seated this morning. She is a public health physician and an epidemiologist, a fellow of the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons, and a fellow of the Rockefeller Foundation, Professor Ansa. Professor Evelyn Koko Ansa has served and continues to serve at global and national levels in various capacities. She was the vice chair of the Global Funds Technical Review Panel to combat HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria until 2019. She currently serves on the WHO Malaria Policy Advisory Committee and Malaria Elimination Oversight Committee. Our keynote speaker had her initial professional training in medicine at the School of Medical Sciences, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Kumasi Osekrum in Ghana. She later pursued a Master of Public Health at the School of Public Health University of Ghana and subsequently had a PhD in epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine University of London. Professor Ansan has worked at all levels of the Ghana health system in both clinical and public health roles for over 25 years. In her clinical roles, she worked at the Rich Hospital and at the Kolebutichin Hospital. Her public health roles in the Ghana Health Service spanned a period of 15 years during which time she progressed from district medical officer to district director of health service and also ended up as the deputy director responsible for research at the national level to spearhead the development of the Ghana Health Service research agenda for the period of 2015 to 2019. Professor Evelyn Koko and Sun's key research interests are in malaria case management, diagnostic, health systems, maternal health, and capacity building for health research. And to this end, she has conducted a number of multi-country and local studies, including clinical trials and health systems research. With a round of applause, I would like us to welcome Professor Evelyn Koko Ansa, who has played significant roles in my life. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, Mary, um, I have a soft spot for Mary because there's a special relationship we have. And I'm really honored to be here. Professor Chair, um, deans and directors of institutes and the University of Health and Allied Sciences, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'm really honored to be asked to deliver this keynote address for such an important conference, which, of which under the theme, research, policy, and religion, the potential role of multi-sectoral collaboration to improve outcomes of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. For me, this is a throwback and, and a sense of nostalgia to my three years in Rich Hospital, 
working in the Department of Obstetric and Gynecology. And the CEO is here, I salute you. And also over 15 years as a district director in a health system. And as a district director, maternal and child health issues are central to whatever we do. Plus, I'm a mother of three children. Having gone through this pregnancy journey three times and survived. And so this really resonates completely with me. Maternal health is certainly not just a women's issue. It's not a women's issue only at all. It affects whole households. It affects families. It affects communities. It affects societies. It affects nations. And because the well-being of the mother and the well-being of their children is central to any nation. And a mother's well-being is central to what humanity is able to achieve. We are talking about hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. Gestational hypertension, as we know, is a pregnant woman who is 20 weeks or above, has a blood pressure, the systolic more than or equal to 140 millimeters mercury, and diastolic more than or equal to 90 millimeters mercury. And this particular spectrum, this particular disease has several presentations, a whole range of presentation that I think that the obstetricians and gynecologists will delve into. But this is very important because for many years, hemorrhage has, be, has been a number one cause of maternal mortality. But like Dr. Fofia said, in recent times, we are beginning to see hypertensive disorders in pregnancy almost neck to neck with hemorrhage. And we must do something about this. You watched a video which was a narrative of experiences of women who have gone through this and also husbands of women who have gone through these, um, these hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Now, some of these women at a point when they were going through were well aware of their conditions and could seek help. But you notice that from the beginning, Koiwa was not too aware of this condition, was almost clueless about this. And therefore, to my mind, the greater challenge we have as a society, I believe, is that several women, several people are completely unaware of this very important condition, which is affecting only women who are pregnant. It doesn't affect anybody but women who are pregnant just this category of people. And many people are blissfully unaware of it until it comes close to their doorsteps. And therefore, because they are unaware, they are not aware of the signs and symptoms. They are not aware when it's beginning. And they don't know what the warning signs are in order to seek help. To illustrate this, I will tell you a brief life story about a lady I will call Fafa since we are in the Volta region. So I'll call this lady Fafa. And this is a real life story happening in 2019. Fafa was a 25-year-old seamstress. She was a Christian. She had completed JSS. And she had been married for three years and was living with her husband. Her two previous pregnancies had ended up in stillbirth. Fafa was pregnant now for the third time. She was generally okay until at 29 weeks of pregnancy, attending the antenatal clinic, it was realized that her BP was going up. She was given medicine to take and was advised to go to the nearest hospital in view of her history for obstetrician care. However, all along, going through all of these experiences, 
Fafa was of the strong view that some ancestral spirits were responsible for her earlier stillbirth. And those spirits will try to do the same with this pregnancy as well. She had told her husband this and had indicated that she wanted to go to a prayer camp nearby to be able to get the help she needs to drive away those ancestral spirits and make them powerless so they don't attack this third child as well. But her husband had told her, listen to the health providers. Just stay with the health system and stay with your church. So she realized that if she was going to have a discussion on this issue with her husband, she wasn't going to get the help she needed. So right from the hospital, instead of from the clinic, instead of going for the referral, she headed for the prayer camp. And there she joined the prayer. And during the prayer that evening, she began to have seizures. Now in the prayer camp, the people there were not too aware of what was going on. In their mind, the spirits were trying to um, um, show their power. So they prayed more and more and tried to pray so that this will end. After four long hours of prayer with seizure going on, they realized that this was not working. So one of them decided, seeing that this woman was pregnant, they didn't even know her. They, she would take the woman to the hospital, and she did. I am sorry to say, Fafa died not long after arrival in the hospital, and the baby could not be saved. So what was this about? Fafa was only trying to have a child. She wasn't doing anything unusual. She was trying to have a child, and she was using all her maternal instincts to protect her unborn child. But I say that no woman in this age should die while doing what is perfectly natural to do. That is giving birth to a child and providing the world with the next generation who will take over from us. Throughout this experience and the previous stillbirths, Fafa was receiving a variety of information from a number of sources. And what were these sources of information? There were the health providers who were telling Fafa about the signs of what was happening and telling her what to do. There was her husband. There was also religion and traditional beliefs meeting together. There were also family and friends giving advice. Now, let's take the health providers. They gave their information on the signs of what was happening to her, but did they explain this to her understanding? Or was it just instructions on what to take, what to do, and where to go next? Mami ubefe drowe, why? U bipi na kostru, ubefe dro, bomodi ane fao. Na ye be mwa ko hospital, because wa wu wani yen tu menye nwa ha, inti ese wuko doctor. Inti ye mwa ko hospital, ufi ya, ko hospital ni straight. Is that what Fafa was told? Or was everything explained to Fafa to her understanding? Did they really take account of Fafa's religious and traditional beliefs and try to address them in their conversations with her and allay her fears? Did they empower Fafa's husband, a significant other, with the knowledge that will enable him to support Fafa as she tried to na navigate this pregnancy journey? Did they give him the knowledge he needed besides knowing that his wife needed to go here and there. Are there missed opportunities here from the health sector? The husband, he believed the health providers knew best, but what was he himself told? And did he know enough to be able to explain to his wife beyond saying, do what they are telling you to do? Could he give her effective and knowledgeable support? Traditional beliefs meeting religion. 
the explanation it seems from these sources for what was happening to Fafa seems to have been clearer to Fafa. The explanation from here seemed to have been very clear to Fafa and was probably backed up by some family and friends. The people at the prayer camp seemed to be completely unaware of the issue of eclampsia, even though they may have seen several cases in the past. It's an opportunity for collaborating with them and for raising awareness on this important issue of hypertensive disorders in pregnancy being lost by health providers and researchers. Are we losing an opportunity? Is it that if we such that if we were to be able to collaborate, perhaps they may do their prayer very quickly and send Fafa off to the hospital since there is no distance in prayer? Are there research gaps in strategies for engaging stakeholders, communities, and women's groups in churches and in various places, in mosques? In, in, in our efforts to address this, that we are missing. During this conference, we will be hearing from health providers, we'll be hearing from religious leaders, we'll be hearing from researchers, we will hear from policy makers, and we will hear, if we have heard from the judiciary, we will still be hearing from them, and we will hear from academics. And some of these issues, that I have raised with Fafa's story will hopefully be addressed. It is my hope that we will be able to thoroughly discuss ways in which multisectoral collaboration between all of these groups can contribute to better maternal and perinatal health outcomes for women with hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. And together, we identify research or knowledge gaps that need to be filled. I wish all of us a fruitful deliberation and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor. Evelyn Kokoasa, can we please give her another round of applause? Please? And what I, I like about uh, Professor Ansan's uh, talk is the fact that she is an accomplished and internationally uh, accomplished scientist and a researcher. And yet she presented something that has scientific and clinical significance in a personal way for first story. And she has highlighted some of the gaps there and I'm sure the chairman has picked on these and uh, these are going to be interesting for our panel discussion as well. So we are taking note. So thank you very much. I just want us to acknowledge um, other uh, important people who have joined us. Uh, Professor John Osu Japon, Vice Chancellor of the University of Health and Allied Sciences is in the house. So, round of applause. Thank you. And we also have a lot of young people who have joined us. And I think that is very important. From our high schools, various tertiary uh, institutions across uh, this area. Uh, and it is testament to the importance of community engagement and getting the young people to begin to understand some of these things because very soon they are going to become parents and they are going to encounter some of these. And I want to believe that some of them may have even already within their families uh, had uh, some of these experiences from parents and, and other family uh, members. Uh, just for housekeeping, uh, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this uh, building, we have our washrooms at the back end of this auditorium, but on the ground floor. The easiest way to locate it is either through the side door, and then there's an entrance, or I mean through here. But you can also go upstairs and then uh, descend the staircase uh, at the left uh, end. So, 
uh, at this juncture, we are going to move into the next session of our conference on hypertension management of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy in Ghana. And in this session, we are going to be focusing on updates uh, and ongoing research uh, on the subjects. We will have our break after this session. So please bear with us. And so at this point, I would like to introduce our next uh, speaker who is um, presenting uh, on the Ghana situation. All right. Yeah, so um, we are going to start with the, the, the management of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy in Ghana. And uh, we have two sessions. The first part will deal with updates and ongoing research. And the second part will deal with the policy and religious aspects. However, uh, before we do that, we're going to have a very brief interlude at this point um, so that we can re uh, configure and and get our online uh, system uh, working i think we're falling off a little bit on the zoom and we want all participants to uh, fully enjoy uh, this so we'll have a brief musical interlude and then we'll be back thank you
speaker, our next speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Abraham Beidu uh, from the Ghana Health Service. Uh, before I introduce the speaker, can I just say to all presenters that we are going to be monitoring the time very strictly. So we please um, ask you to try and stay within the allotted time so that we don't uh, overrun. Uh, Dr. Beidu is a specialist obstetrician gynecologist and a field epidemiologist um, having undergone training at a Ghana field epidemiology and laboratory training program. He is a program officer uh, for the Safe Motherhood program within the Ghana Health Service at the Family Health Division. And uh, so, Dr. Beidu, you are welcome. Thank you very much. Good morning. Honorable Chair, distinguished guests and personalities, speakers for the program, ladies and gentlemen. I'm presenting on management of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. The situation, the situation in Ghana and updates the progress and the challenges. And what I'll highlight is going to be elaborated by the speakers that will follow. So I wouldn't want to bore you with a lot of clinical stuff. But then by means of, of an outline, you will briefly do a short introduction look at the situation of management of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy in Ghana. Look at the current updates and interventions that are under consideration. The challenges to the management of these hypertensive disorders and then the way forward. Yes. So that is the outline. We know hypertensive disorders of pregnancy to have a an untoward effect on the outcome of pregnancy with regard to both the mother and the fetus. And this manifests itself in diverse ways with outcomes that might end up in the extreme side as a mortality to either the mother or the unborn baby. And preeclampsia, eclampsia, as of 2020, contributed to about a fifth of all direct causes of maternal death in the country. And this means that putting together preeclampsia and then hemorrhage, that is accounting for almost about 40 to 50% of our total direct causes of maternal mortality. And therefore, an attempt to try and bridge the gap and reduce mortalities or manage these cases promptly and appropriately is a step in the right direction to reduce our mortality burden. And as part of the roadmap to the country achieving a universal health coverage as per the Sustainable Development Goals, 
hypertensive disorders of pregnancy need to be targeted as one of the interventions that are necessary to reduce maternal and perinatal mortality. So Ghana is committed to the universal health coverage agenda over the period of 2020 to 2030. And the vision is to prom promote timely access to high quality health care. And that promotion is independent of cost, which means it does not matter whether the patient has the ability to pay for the service or not, the care needs to be rendered. But unfortunately, we find ourselves with an insurance system that cannot cater for all the health needs of the person seeking health care. And sometimes there is an element of co-payment and that can come in as a challenge to healthcare delivery. So with regards to the levels of our care that we have per our system, we have the primary healthcare level that has the personnel, has the basic means to attend to the patient presenting with hypertensive disorder of pregnancy. Basically, you go to the chief compounds, the health centers, they have been equipped to at least check the blood pressure of the woman and then carry out a urine protein test with strips to find out if there is any proteinuria in cases of preeclampsia suspicion as a routine part of the antenatal care that women receive when they go to the clinic. But then it's not all the time that you go and find these blood pressure monitors to be in good shape or to be functional. And sometimes too, these trips might run out and there might be challenges in procuring them because of certain things that might pertain to those lower levels. Secondly, we find gaps to exist in referral. And that is one of the greatest challenges that we find in our healthcare system that we are running. Because identifying the case might not be the starting point, as we all know, with regard to preeclampsia and eclampsia conditions or hypertensive disorders of pregnancy in general. It comes with an initial circulate that might have gone on in the patient. And the patient might be chanced on at a point or at a point in time in the point in the care process or in the health delivery process. But the ability to recognize what the patient is presenting with and the prompt referral of the patient. Getting the patient or the client, let me use client in this case because we don't consider pregnant women as patients. Let's assuming I'm seeing that client and then in that perspective, being in the capability of identifying the dangers that the client is, is perceiving or is undergoing or going through and referring the client appropriately with the right level of education to bring care to the understanding of why there is the need to refer her to the next facility is important. And it just doesn't end there, facilitating the process to ensure that the patient or the, sorry, the client gets to the next stage of care and that is instituted. The service has advocated for referral platforms that have facilitated clients to get to the facility, uh, referral facilities in a state where the referring facility or the facility going to receive the, patient, the client has put in place the necessary measures to prepare in receiving that client. When we get to the, at the same at the primary um, healthcare level, the use of magnesium sulfate for prevention of um, complications of preeclampsia and as part of the management of eclampsia is also an issue that sometimes generates a lot of um, problems because you might not find it in some of these facilities or it might be present, but maybe it has been put at a place under lock, or lock and key and all that. And this might pose challenges as far as these things need to be considered and then expedited in the management of the patient. At the secondary level, here we have a, resource, a human resource mix compared to the primary level where you might just have maybe an attending midwife to manage the client. So this human resource mix 
needs to go in tandem with an equipment or infrastructure to help improve diagnostics and then monitoring of the client. But at this level, it's not all the facilities that we have that might be equipped with the necessary equipment that might be needed when it comes to complications of hypertensive disorders that need to be managed. And the, result, the final result has to be the tertiary level, which are very few and as such tend to be overburdened. And as such, they, it comes with the need to try to triage and then find out the best way to better manage the situation so as to be able to render healthcare to these clients who are suffering from hypertensive disorders. So at the tertiary level, we are talking about an improved staff skill level. So you will find all the obstetrician gynecologists who might be sparsely distributed when you come to the, the secondary level. But then together with other clinicians, other um, facilitators, as far as healthcare delivery is concerned, they might not be able to do what they are supposed to because there might be equipment or infrastructure handicap in one way or the other. You take a look at our intensive care system. How many beds do we have in our intensive care facilities when it comes to our tertiary institutions? This limited capacity to improve care with regards to diagnostics. It's not every requested investigation that can be carried out in all these institutions. That is where the private sector comes in to augment. But this also comes in with a cost to the client. And the question we ask ourselves is how many of these clients in their states or with our social backgrounds are in a position to afford this level of care with regards to these investigations that need to be um, done when they are requested. Then the management of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, as we know, is multidisciplinary. And the care involves a whole spectrum of healthcare professionals to come together to appropriately manage these clients. But the question is how well is the coordination that goes on at that level? Sometimes it might take in, it might take, or it might prolong before this collaboration is facilitated. And that can come in as a, a form of detriment to the total care given to the patient. The system, is designed in such a way that now referrals are facilitated. The um, tertiary institutions, the secondary institutions are in close relation with the primary facilities through networks and linkages to try and help manage the situation on the ground before the referral is done. But the challenges with regards to referral and the other things that have to accompany the care are the issues that bring uh, uh, problems as far as this care is concerned. There is a need for straight client selection criteria in the tertiary institutions because of the limited capacity and then the diagnostic challenges that may arise. Now, with regards to current updates, things like the routine use of soluble aspirin and oral calcium, in order to try and then serve as a preventive mechanism for preeclampsia. This is not something that is used or practiced generally as a policy, but there are some professionals who are, um, who are um, advocating for it and then giving it to clients that they see. But the, the broader spectrum is as to how to streamline this into the main healthcare so that it will be part of our practice. That will be delved in by other speakers who come in. The use of magnesium sulfate regimen, the current usage that we are doing, is there a way to shorten the duration or the number of doses that we are giving to these women and still achieve what we intend to do? That will also be looked at, so I wouldn't want to go into that. Then improving um, the survival of the baby with corticosteroids, that is what is practiced but it's not all centers that you go and find this. So there's a need to also um, put in measures to improve on that. The other things have to do with diagnostic, as I've mentioned earlier, intensive care, where it has to get to the point where the patient will need dialysis. 
Then the point, it, it comes in where there is a need for the family, the society to render the patient with support, psychosocial support, both from the a psychological point of view and then from the family and all those around the patients. So the management of preeclampsia is multidisciplinary as we have emphasized. And the challenges that come with it, we know them already, high morbidity mortality, the high default rate among these clients because they don't understand sometimes what we mean by telling them to come on admission when they are walking around with nothing happening to them. They are normal, but we have checked their blood pressures and we think their blood pressures are high. We have noticed urine in their protein, so they have to come on admission. So the poor knowledge and understanding, late presentation, that occurs sometimes with this severe complications that are associated with it, and then high preterm deliveries with this high perinatal mortalities. The other challenges have to do with human resource, specific to the level of care, equipments and supplies, like I mentioned in the previous slides, the high cost of management of these complications that may arise from hypertensive disorders, and the limited data to enhance decision making, because we generate a lot of data from management of preeclampsia, eclampsia, other hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, but putting this data into good use to inform practice and improve on care is where we lack. Then poor guidelines on up-to-date up management of these clients. These are the suggested management plans that we see in our routine practice. I wouldn't want to go into that. The subsequent presenters will outline that. And the suggested policy improvements that we are looking at is to develop protocols that will help in the management and the continuous care of these pregnancy and um, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, including the complications that arise out of it. We are recording mortalities with hypertensive disorders, but how well are we implementing the audit recommendations that come out of the routine auditing of these mortalities to improve on clinical practice? That is another area that we are trying to improve on. And then with regards to data improvement to help with decision making, especially with regards to morbidities, and then near misses, because we seem to be focusing our attention on mortalities. But if you can identify the near misses, learn from them. cost management to improve on outcomes and the complications that are identified need to be tailored and then the interventions have to be tailored and then be context specific so that at every level the interventions can be put in appropriately and then finally the audit recommendations from the mortalities need to be implemented to improve on practice thank you very much Thank you very much, Dr. Bedu. Uh, you've given us a lot of food for thought. I think you set the scene for um, subsequent discussion. So thank you very much. I am particularly interested in, you mentioned uh, mortality audit. I'm interested in clinical audit as, uh, uh, as a whole. And uh, it'll be interesting to see during the panel discussion, uh, what people, what we have, and how we can work together to improve things. So thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Emmanuel Sofrenio. Um, and he is the medical director of the Greater Accra Regional Hospital. Um, Dr. Sofenyo is a fellow of the West Africa College of Surgeons and a foundation fellow 
of the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons. He is a consultant and chair of obstetrics and gynecology, as well as a medical director at the Greater Accra Regional Hospital. After a long uh, service in various regions, in various clinical domains, uh, he has accomplished a lot and um, he's uh, a, safe, a key safe mother, uh, motherhood trainer and coordinator and a national trainer in emergency obstetric uh, services. He has co-authored scientific research articles on quality improvement strategies in facilities in low resource settings. And um, he has also been quite um, involved at the international level in presenting conference papers. So Dr. Sofrenio's talk today for, uh, with us is on preeclampsia, the severe preeclampsia adverse outcomes triage. It is a spot study and he's going to present to us. Thank you. And uh, before you speak, I just want to acknowledge uh, another key person who's just joined us, the registrar of the University of Health Allied Sciences and Allied Sciences, Dr. Cynthia Senam Peglo uh, is in the house. You're welcome. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to stand before you, August people, to present to you on the sport group of studies, on the sport group of studies, which simply means severe preeclampsia outcome triage score. We've already been told that hypertensive diseases of pregnancy uh, are among the top three causes of maternal mortality and is rapidly becoming a leading cause of maternal mortality, especially in low resource settings. And if you take a look at the map, you see that the impact has been heaviest on the African continent. It moved. It moved. Thank you, but don't count the five minutes loss of time against me. <laughs> so when you look at the map showing there, you see that the impact 
of preeclampsia, DEV, has been heaviest on the African continent, West Africa, and then eastern part of Africa. The northern part of Africa has been paired a lot. Of, so that is where we are. In Ghana, for example, maternal mortality ratio has been 308 to 100,000 live births, nearly 15% of that uh, due to hypertensive diseases of pregnancy. So the pathogenesis of what is the cause? And the fact, I'm sorry to tell you that the actual cause of this disease condition is largely unknown, even though there are a number of theories. We talk about the placental invasion theory, where we believe that the placenta has not been appropriately implanted, and that is why preeclampsia occurs. We also talk about the exaggerated systemic inflammation theory and then immunological theories. The theories go on and on and on and on. Mostly for diseases that we don't understand well, we normally have theories. Having said that, we know we have two pathological types. The early onset type that those diseases that occur or the preeclamptic disease that occur before 34 completed weeks. And then we have the late onset type. And we believe that the two may be completely different disease condition or different pathological type of preeclampsia by occurring in the same pregnant women. Now, most hypertensive disease related maternal mortality and morbidity occur with the severe and the early onset time. So the early onset time is the one that we have so many other questions and where the management is most challenging. What are the options available for us if we want to reduce mortality and morbidity associated with these diseases? First, we can have predictions and appropriate prevent preventive treatment. Predictions. So if we have a set of tests that we can do to determine which pregnant woman is at risk of developing this condition so that we can have appropriate preventive treatment, and that can be described as primary prevention. Then we can have early detection and management of pregnant women. So assuming that the woman is pregnant, how can we detect this condition? What systems do we put in place to detect these conditions early enough? so that they can be managed through the pregnancy until they deliver. That could be equivalent to secondary prevention. Then at the tertiary level, we can talk about improved quality of care for those who come late with severe diseases. What systems can we put in place so that we can manage them successfully and then rehabilitate them and restore them back to normal life? Those can be described at the three levels of prevention. Now, to focus my attention at the third level, that is management of women who are affected by severe diseases. What has been the standard guidelines? The standard guideline has been that because we believe that the disease emanates from the placenta, the teaching has been deliver the woman and remove the placenta. Deliver the baby out and remove the placenta because we believe that is the root cause. This has been the standard recommendation. For those people who develop the disease, let's say after 34 weeks, 36 weeks, and you develop, you define preeclampsia, you can just go ahead and do the delivery because you know that 34 weeks, 36 weeks, 38 weeks, the baby is likely to survive. So you don't have any limitations. For those who have the disease very early, let's say less than 26 weeks, also, oftentimes, when we try to manage them, we realize that the outcomes are not usually good. So clinicians don't have any limitations in, in taking a decision to deliver them. However, the gray area has been between 26 and 34 weeks. Many experts and consultants are tempted to do conservative management to allow the baby to develop a little bit more so that the baby can survive. And so this is what led to what we call the expectant management. Expectant management can prolong the pregnancy and improve outcomes. Data that is being collected in the Greater Accra Regional Hospital has shown that even when we delay the delivery by about a week, let's say from 28 weeks to 29 weeks, you can improve outcomes from 36 to 35 percent, or by prolonging the pregnancy from by two weeks from 28 weeks to 30 weeks, you can improve outcomes. However, there is a downside. The downside is that in carrying out this 
conservative management approach, you could end up with the woman losing her life if you don't really understand all the risks that the woman is exposed to. And so the other approach is to just deliver everybody, which we call the interventionist approach. But the downside of this one too is that if the woman is, let's say, 27 weeks or 27, 26 weeks pregnant, and you just deliver, then the baby is likely to die when the baby gets to the neonatal intensive care unit. So the, the actual thing that is happening to the obstetricians and the people who are managing these women is that of dilemma. They find themselves in a situation of dilemma between the devil and the deep blue sea, not knowing what decisions to make. Recent research has shown that in developed countries, expectant or conservative management is possible under certain well-defined conditions. But these findings cannot be completely translatable to our setting in lower middle income situation. Risk prediction models can be an important model that can help us determine who are the people at risk who needed to be delivered immediately or who are the people who at less risk who can be allowed to prolong, to go on with the pregnancy for some time before finally they are delivered. And so this leads us to risk prediction models. So increasingly, risk prediction model is gaining ground in modern medicine, especially in low resource settings. And individuals predicted risks of an advert outcome will allow us to triage the patient between the higher risks, moderate risks, uh, uh, low risks, so that you know what decision to take. If it is high risk, you will take a quick decision to deliver. If it is low risk, you may want to prolong the pregnancy a little. That the risk prediction model can guide in organization and provide provision of quality healthcare to the right person at the right time and at the right moment. We need risk prediction for adverse maternal outcome during preeclampsia to guide decision making. So, two, two um, risk predictive models have been developed by studies in other parts of the world which we call mostly the PS study. So we have the full PS and then the mini PS studies models. So the full PS models look at certain parameters that had been pre predicted to indicate that the woman is at higher risk. So some of these parameters and the full PS are chest pain or dyspnea, oxygen saturation, that's low oxygen saturation, platelet levels, serum creatinine level, and serum ASTs. So when you have these parameters that are going out of range, then you know that yes, this woman is at risk and therefore you need to think about delivering the woman. Then we also have mini PS, mini PS model. And this model has been designed solely for developing countries where there may not be laboratory equipment for you to do all the tests that I'm, I talk about. And so then you focus mainly, mostly on presence of certain signs and symptoms, chest pain, vaginal bleeding, abdominal pain, systolic blood pressures and diastolic blood pressures. So these are some of the things that have been developed. Now, why did we set up the spot study infrastructure? This was established, I said, we established a research infrastructure on hypertensive diseases. Collaboration, this was a collaboration between academia, health institutions in Ghana, Netherlands, and the United States. We started in 2017, transdisciplinary with involvement of various different kinds of experts. These are the various institutions, Ghana Health Service, the Columbia Teaching Hospital, H3 Africa, and many other institutions, Tennessee University, and many other institutions are involved. And the overarching aim is to improve the quality of care for women with preeclampsia remote from them. We are talking about those preeclampsia that developed before 34 completed weeks. Our aim generally is to facilitate translation of WHO quality framework for, from, for mothers into daily clinical practice in low resource setting. The general aim is generate practical guidance for the development and implementation in low resource settings of clinical decision-making tools based on the predicted risk. So we have a predicted risk, which I will show to you later, 
But then the risk prediction is not a now. There are other components. And so we are seeking to develop a toolkit that will include the risk prediction model, but has other elements that will complete the model, which will enable us to implement and successfully reduce mortality. So I want to just show you the element of the toolkit that we want to develop. So first of all, the blue arm, it shows blue on my uh, slide here, but the color is not quite blue over there. But the first arm is the predicted toolkit, the mathematical kit, which after doing the various investigations will tell us that this woman is a high risk, it's a low risk, and so on and so forth. Then we also have risk communication component. So yes, the woman have risk, but how well are we communicating this risk to the woman? From the story about Fafa that was told us earlier on, you realize that probably the healthcare professionals did not give adequate information and educated this woman adequately together with the family for them to understand that this is the risk that I face. And therefore, these are the best decisions that I can take. That had not been done. In the toolkit that we want to formulate, we want risk communication to become paramount in this toolkit. Then the third arm is shared decision making. It is no longer appropriate for the clinicians to take the decision all by themselves. That yes, because your blood pressure has gone up, I want to deliver your pregnancy. It is important for you to educate the woman and then the family, all the important others within her life. So that together as a team, the woman herself, the family, the other important organs, together with the clinical team, you take a decision as to how best this pregnancy should be managed moving forward. So what are the other important objectives? After we develop the two kids, we want to evaluate the impact of the two for shared decision making to improve quality of care and maternal health outcomes in referral hospitals. We will select some big hospitals where these two kits will be first implemented to understand the feasibility barriers and en enablers for the tool implementation before we move to the point of scaling up. Then we also introduce port bio. Now we know that there, are, there is a genetic predisposition for preeclampsia. In two independent studies, it was recently observed the pregnant African-American, these studies were done in the US, pregnant African-American women whose fetuses carry two high-risk genes, Apple L1 variant, have approximately twice the risk of developing preeclampsia compared to other uh, pregnant women. And then up to 25% of these individuals in West Africa and 13% of African-Americans carry this abnormal gene that we are talking about and this increases their risk. So the main objective of the sport bio, the sport bio study, which is a component of the sport study, is to quantify the relationship between fetal and maternal apple L1 status and preeclampsia, and to assess whether this can predict preeclampsia. So we want to quantify the, first of all, the prevalence of this gene in our population, and that is not the end to quantify the relationship between this gene and development of the preeclampsia and how we can use this to, to predict those women who are at higher risk and use it to protect them, put in place systems that can help us to protect these women. So I just want to summarize some of the other elements of the SPORT study. So I've just spoken about the SPORT bio study where we are looking specifically at the gene that may be responsible and how we can take advantage, detect these genes early. And as I said earlier on, now we know that this gene is the fetal gene and not the maternal gene that is responsible for causation of this condition. Then we also have a spot protein creatinine study. We know, as you may all be aware, recently we are no more so interested in urine protein because urine protein has been found not to be very, very good in predicting severity of the disease compared to other parameters. And so the concept has come to introduce urine protein creatinine uh, measurement, which is also being studied under the sport. Then we have the sport exposome, where we believe that the disease become more severe in those women who live in more, uh, in, in environment that are more polluted 
than in cleaner environment, that the risk may even be higher for developing of the disease when you live in a more polluted or also even depending on the type of uh, uh, fuel that you use, for example. And then this again is part of this study. Then we have spot mental health to determine the prevalence of mental health disorders during pregnancy and also in the postpartum period among women diagnosed with preeclampsia, for example, so that we measure. Because we know that going through this condition is not easy. Those who have gone through have shared their experiences with us, and we can appreciate what they went through. And so what is the quantum of impact on their mental health? What is it that we can put in place so that when the woman goes through this, the woman does not lose her, her, her psychological status? Then we have, lastly, the spot sex steroids, which is trying to measure the effect of sex steroids on the pathogenesis. This is trying to focus on another part of the pathogenesis of the disease to find out whether there is a difference in sex steroid levels in the pregnant women who develop preeclampsia as compared to pregnant women who did not develop preeclampsia. And if there is a difference, how we can take advantage of this difference to put in place systems to see whether we can use that to detect those who are likely to develop preeclampsia later on, or even to use that to manage the situation as time goes on. So the sports study summary, this shows the summary of the various things that we are doing under the sports study uh, consortium. First of all, I can say that there is an epidemiology component where we are measuring the burden of the disease incidence of adverse outcome and maternal health. Those are some of the things we are looking at. At the next stage, experiences and provision of care. That is the next thing that we are looking at. So this aspect is looking at the experience of the woman. Women who have gone through our health system, who have received care, who have had this complication, what has been their experiences? These have been studied, both qualitatively and also quantitatively. We are also looking at genetic, no, etiology where we are looking at genetic factors, biomarkers, prediction of hypertension, and then sex steroid study, as we mentioned out. And finally, we are also looking at quality of care improvement. Quality of care improvement. Spot impact, which I've spoken about, is that segment that is looking at quality of care. And then the spot protein creatinine study is also looking at how we can use protein creatinine strips to better measure severity of the condition, uh, to, to better measure severity of the condition. This brings me to the end of my presentation and I hope I've stayed within time. I thank you all very much for listening attentively. Thank you very much, Dr. Sofrenio. I think this is getting more and more exciting and hotter and hotter. Uh, we are being given more and more insights into um, pregnancy, uh, uh, hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. We are going to have our last um, presentation for this session before our break. And um, this is going to be given uh, by Professor Emmanuel uh, Moche and uh, Dr. Anthony Kwame Da. I think uh, Dr. Da is here to speak on behalf of the, the group. And Dr. Anthony Kwame Da is a senior specialist obstetrician and gynecologist at the whole uh, teaching. Okay, thank you very much. I've just been corrected. Dr. Da is actually a consultant obstetrician gynecologist at the whole teaching hospital and a lecturer here at the University of Health and Allied Sciences. So, Dr. Da.
Thank you all. Good morning. Uh, I'm presenting on the appetizing disorders in pregnancy or of pregnancy uh, that you have who are teaching of the experience. My name is Dr. Antonio Kamita. This is my presenting outline. I'll look at the introduction, the prevalence of habitation disorders at Hotiki Hospital, the outcome of pregnancy with habitation disorders in pregnancy at Hotiki Hospital. And before we are tertiary institution, we also teach and conduct research. So I will just talk briefly on the research collaboration that we are doing. Now in the South Africa, Sahara Africa study showed that the full prevalent rate of habitat disorders in pregnancy is eight per pregnancies. So in every pregnancy, 8% develop habitat disorder in pregnancy. And if you look at it, the leading among the subtypes are the preeclampsia and gestational habitation, which is 4.1%. There was a study in Kumasi by Dasan and Co. We look at the habitat disorder in pregnancy, and they read that the trend is similar to what is obtained in South Sahara Africa. That preeclampsia was leading by 48.8%, followed closely by gestational hypertension, which is 32.4%. And it's well known that the adverse outcome of habitat in pregnancy are higher in developing countries compared to developed countries. And the outcomes, the adverse outcomes include the preterm birth, low birth weight, low agar scores, and maternal perinatal mortality. So my, okay. so my presentation will be on the review of the record at Hoji of the on hypertension disorder in pregnancy. And I'll be looking just at the descriptive analysis that is the prevalence and the outcome. I will not go into inferential analysis because of lack of time. So I will look at the prevalence of habitat disorder in pregnancy at who teaching hospital. Okay, um, the prevalence of hypertension disorder in pregnancy at who teaching hospital. Uh, this is for the year January to December 2021 year review. The total number of deliveries was 2,293 as a facility, and among them, 136 had hypertension disorders in pregnancy. And when you calculate the year prevalence, it's 5.9%. If you compare it to South Sahara Africa, which is 8%, I think this one is on the lower side. And among the women with hypertension disorder in pregnancy, 48.1% 48, 48 were referred from peripheral health facility to the teaching hospital. And when we break down the subtype, you know, we have four subtypes. We have a preeclampsia, eclampsia, gestational hypertension, and chronic hypertension. And when we break it down, we realize that the leading one is preeclampsia, taking about 65.6%. And then it can be comparable to that, that the work which was done in Kumasi by Dasan and Co, 
we got 48.8 percent and it was the pre eclampsia that was leading but our way is followed by chronic hypertension where in their study in south sahara africa the second leading cause is gestational hypertension so there's a bit of difference over there uh, we may discuss it later then i look at the the age distribution of the women that had a hypertension disorder in pregnancy and when you look at it you realize that the age group who is most affected is 38 to 34. Or in other words, the age group who are in reproductive age group, the normal one is 25 to 34, and now I have about 66 percent of hypertension disorder in pregnancy. The youngest among them was 15, and the oldest 45. Now I'll go on to, to look at the outcomes of women with hypertension disorder in pregnancy for the year 2021. Uh, looking at the outcome in terms of uh, the timing of delivery, whether they were delivered at term or preterm, the aim of the oxygen gynecologist is to deliver every pregnancy at term when the baby is well matured. But because of the condition, sometimes we were compelled to deliver them earlier than term. However, if you look at the chart, you read that uh, almost just less than 50% were delivered at them. We mean that we are managing them to ensure that the babies are, are, are matured before they are delivered. We have about 2.8% of the women who were compelled to terminate the pregnancy before 28 weeks. Those, those are about 2.8%. Those are the women with hypertension disorder that occur in very early stage of the pregnancy, 20 to 25. And we were not able to control the blood, the blood pressure. Therefore, we cancel them. And those who agree, we have to terminate the pregnancy in order to save the life of the woman. Then another I mean, outcome indicator is the birth weight. Birth weight is the most sensitive indicator in determining the survival of the baby outside the wound of the mother. So when we are managing the woman, we are checking the birth weight to see whether the baby can survive when we bring the baby out. So when the condition of the mother is worsening and we think that the baby can survive outside, we cancel the woman and the spouse and then we deliver the woman. Therefore, in at the teaching of the for the women with hypertension disorder in pregnancy, again, you could see that just a little less than 50% were delivered with a normal birth weight. Those babies with normal birth weight are the babies who are likely not to have a problem when they come out. So a number about less than 50 had a normal birth weight, which is a very good news. We have just about 7.4 who have extreme, extreme Low birth weight, that is those baby who birth weight is less than one kilogram. Very often, those are the ones that we often terminate because of the condition of the mother. Now, we also look at the, the birth status of the babies, whether they are alive or dead, the APCA score, and then the nuclear admissions. If you look at the chart, we have a still birth rate of 6.6. Uh, percent among the women with hypertension disorder in pregnancy, 6.6 percent, which is higher than the national figure of 2.0 percent, according to 2017 Matena Health Survey. But of course, these are the women with hypertension disorder in pregnancy with complications. So 6.6, I think, is comparable to other areas as well. Now, when we look at the ACA score, if you look at the trend, rather right at the first minute, we have a low agar score of 11.1. .1. By the fifth minutes, that drop no, of 70.3, that dropped to 11 because of resource station. And if you look at the baby with a normal agar score increases at 5%, means that the resource station team is also doing quite well. But majority of, uh, of our babies end in NUKU, neonatal care unit. That's about 65.3%. There are many reasons to this. One of the reasons is that uh, in our facility, 
The protocol is that all pretend deliveries should pass through NICU for assessment by the pediatrician before they are released to their mothers. And since hypertension disorder in pregnancy is one of the leading causes of pretend, so we should expect our babies, most of them, to be pretend, and therefore they will end up in NICU. Another reason is that all low birth weight are also supposed to be referred to NICU for assessment by the pediatrician. And also, baby low agar score, agar score of less than six, are also supposed to be sent to NICU for assessment. And because of all these reasons, that's why you can, you can see that women with or uh, baby with who are de who are delivered by women who have been disorder in pregnancy are likely to be admitted to NICU for one reason or the other before they are discharged. Now, I will look at the maternal outcome of hypertension disorders in pregnancy at the teaching hospital in the US. Uh, within the 2021, 20, January to December, we recorded, unfortunately, 22 maternal deaths. And after that, seven were due to hypertension disorders in pregnancy and its complications. If you calculate the proportion that add up to 31%, means that 31% is due to hypertension disorder in pregnancy. Now, 13 of our women that develop hypertension disorder in pregnancy end up in NICU, neonatal or intensive care unit. What often happens is that the refer cases for the periphery are often in a very bad state before they reach the teaching hospital. So the arrangement is that immediately they reach over there, the team on duty will assess when the condition is bad, we straight refer the woman to NICU and go and resort, I mean, to the intensive care unit. And we go to resource state the woman over there before we plan the delivery for the survival of the woman. And then among them, three of them had dialysis due to acute kidney injury. Last but not the least, I'll just talk briefly about uh, what else are we doing as a teacher institution which is involved in teaching and research. Uh, as a teacher, uh, when we are teaching, there are a lot of things that come into play. And like a health professional, when we look at the trend of the health condition in the, in the country, in the community, that will determine where we lay emphasis on when we are teaching the students. We teach both medical and paramedical students. And when we are teaching, like organizing the exam, rather than having disorder in pregnancy, is one of the leading causes. So if you look at our setting up of exam or teaching them, we lay a lot of emphasis of, on the hypertension disorder in pregnancy. When we teach them, we organize seminars and tutorials on hypertension disorder in pregnancy. With mind that when our products are out there, they are likely to do better as year pass by. Also, there are ongoing interdepartmental and interinstitutional collaborating research on hypertension disorder in pregnancy, I got level two. One is the use of doubler studies in the first and second trimester to detect, to predict development of preeclampsia in this woman. So there's a postgraduate uh, students in a medical imaging who is undertaking this research and is being supervised by the Department of Obstetrician and Gynecology. Another research on molecular biomarkers to predict the outcome of preeclampsia among women with hypertension disorder in pregnancy. Again, there's a postgraduate student who conducted this research from KUST. And then uh, the Department of Health and Ghana of US is supervising the research. On this note, I'll thank you for listening to me. Uh, the aim is that to make sure that our mothers and our and their babies, all of them survive through childbirth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Da, for your wonderful presentation. 
highlighting the problem of hypertensive disorders in pregnancy within our own local uh, teaching hospital. And so we have heard from uh, the speakers and we are going to have 10 minutes for questions and then we'll go for uh, a break. We thought it's better to have all the presentations before we open the floor for questions. We want your questions to be very brief and straight to the point. And um, so you, first of all, indicate who you are, you mention your name. And uh, I think we have a microphone here. Uh, if there are, we have some questions from some of our conference attendees online, which we'll be reading out to the uh, speakers. But uh, for, thank you, for those of us here in the auditorium, um, we want you to ask uh, questions. First of all, uh, the first speaker spoke about the Ghana situation updates, progress and challenges from 2021. And that was uh, Dr. Frimpon Beidou. And then uh, Dr. Emmanuel Strofenyon, he spoke on severe preeclampsia adverse outcomes trials. The SPOT study gave us a lot of insights as well, uh, both mostly from the clinical side and also looking at the pathways of management. And the last speaker just spoke to us on uh, hypertensive disorders in pregnancy at the whole teaching hospital. So the floor is now open for questions. Uh, we'll take just three questions, one for each speaker, I think, to start with. Yes, there's uh, uh, somebody out there. Yeah, one. There's another, there's a lady up there in the middle. Um, yes. Okay. So you, you indicate, you, you tell us your name and indicate who your question is to, which of the speakers, or you can ask and then we will then direct it. Okay, thank you. I'm Gloria Ijekum from Adaklu. And my question is to the last presenter. When he was presenting, he said, most of the cases that had fatalities were from the referral, that's the peripheral facilities. So my question is, is the referral points where the cases were coming from, are they aware that the cases that they referred to the teaching hospital, this is the outcome? And how well is the hospital, the teaching hospital planning to meet with those staffs from the peripheral so that they also be abreast with what is happening? That, oh, the cases they referred probably came late. That is why there were fatalities or that's why people had kidney failures. How are they doing that so that when we are also referring or we know how to do it earlier, then we also have that training. Since they are, the teaching hospital is also training some of their students, did they call upon those at the district levels to come to the hospital for those trainings? Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Yes, there's a gentleman in the middle. Yes. Thank you very much. My name is Joseph Edri Safo. My question goes to the second presenter. He made mention of Africa being a danger zone for preeclampsia. I want to know, um, have they considered our diet? That our mothers or our pregnant mothers, when they eat, it has, it generates some kind of nutrient that has effect on the placenta that will cause the preeclampsia to occur in their research. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we have, uh, uh, yeah, there's, there's a gentleman in a, with a cup, I think. Uh, uh, sorry. Yes, yeah, the hands are up there. Uh, please, just, yeah, go ahead. I think mine is quite similar to what the lady asked. 
I want to find out from the last speaker whether they have got plans for clinical medical address service to district hospitals and other distributed hospitals so that they can provide some capacity to start offering services at that level because he attributed some of the deaths as late referral from these district hospitals or this would have opted to them if there's any plan for the TG hospital to organize clinical address service to those districts. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think we'll ask our speakers to respond. And then if we still have a bit of time, then we'll take the other questions. These are all very important questions. So, um, uh, Dr. Sofran, you want to start first? Yes. Thank you very much. There was a question concerning diet. That is the one that was directed to me. Um, that is it that our mothers are eating something that is impacting negatively on the placenta? The research has not yet found out anything that our mothers eat that is negatively impacting on the placenta. But what we do know that anywhere in the world where calcium intake is less relatively, the incidence of preeclampsia is higher. And it's one of the reasons why we have been giving pregnant women calcium tablets to take. We do know that if that is done early enough, right from about the first trimester, you supplement the pregnant woman with adequate calcium. You know, our part of the world, calcium intake is not as high as in the other parts of the world. We don't really take calcium, we don't drink milk and all those things that supply the body adequate calcium. So this is where the, the factor, this is what can be a factor. And so therefore the issue will be adequate calcium supplementation as a way of preventing preeclampsia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc. Um, yeah. And um, uh, yes, please. Yeah, um, the first question is whether there's any feedback to the periphery regarding the management of the cases that they brought, and then if there's any training program for them. Uh, first of all, I will tell you that uh, the, the bad cases that are coming from there may not necessarily mean that they are not managing well. They are in the community areas, remote areas where the people are less educated, less informed. So very often before the people present, they are already in a bad state to start with. And they often get referred the cases to us at the teaching hospital. And because of the bad nature of the road, so that before they get there, things are even worse. But however, there's a network between us and the referral centers. We have their number, they have our numbers. Even when they have the cases, those that they will manage, they call us, and we direct them how to, how to manage them. Those that they can manage, we advise them to refer. So there is that collaboration between, I mean, the, the specialists in the teaching hospital and the doctor at the periphery. Besides that, very often when we identify the hot spots, we invite the doctors, and then we give them some sort of training. Some of them come some, some time back where we take them through certain training before they go back. So we are doing that. Um, probably we need to step up and do more. I will agree with you. Uh, second question is whether we have been organizing outreach program to go to those facilities to, I mean, support them. I would say yes, in individual basis. But as a teaching hospital organizing that one officially, last we have a meeting on it, we were deliberating how we can organize that. That will also involve uh, what? Finance, resources, which will be a problem. But individually, we do go to the peripheral areas, the college, we go there to go and then go through things with the rotors, then we come back. But probably if time, if the resources, the whole teaching hospital will organize an official one, so that will be going to them. Thank you. Thank you very much. So there are clear needs here uh, in terms of clinical guidelines and direction, training, and also outreach services. And uh, I think in the UK, uh, 
pregnant women are supposed to have a thousand grams of calcium per day. That is the uh, that's the recommended daily intake of calcium, and it is true that because most of our diet is plant based, uh, the sources of calcium are not so much. But then you notice that those who are towards the coastal areas, who take foods that have shells, crabs, and things like that, uh, will have a higher uh, intake of calcium. So yeah. This is uh, quite an important, interesting point. Thank you. Okay, so we have some questions online, and I think it will be fair for us to consider those. So uh, Mary will read to yeah. Thank you. thank you, Prof. And we have quite a number, so please, online participants, I'll take just a couple of them for the sake of time. And the first one says that, how important is the PS model in our context where a single aspect of the model may constitute severity. And then that's from Portia Graham. Then we have, we have from Dr. Asuma Kubri saying that he thanks you for the lectures. His concern is the no bed syndrome, that we are talking about bad cases coming to the teaching hospital. But when we call them to bring cases, we are denied of the, the referral because of no bed. Why is this? And what are we doing to, to deal with that? Emmanuel Yamwa says that what are the definite rules outlined for the other healthcare workers, especially in the public health, in contributing to combat the incidence of preeclampsia at the various levels of healthcare delivery? And we are talking about collaboration. So I think this is quite important. Last but not the least, also saying that if cases are increasing and putting the life of the mother and unborn fetus in danger after saving the life of both or one, what must we do to prevent future occurrences? Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I don't know if I think all three speakers, um, yes. Uh, so maybe we'll start with Dr. Bedu. And then uh, we'll take it from there. Thank you. Thank you. I will touch on the collaboration with the public health service. Like um, it was mentioned in the presentation, issues to do with hypertensive disorders of pregnancy needs collaboration with all stakeholders involved. And Public health plays a central role as far as, 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 far as management of preeclampsia and then eclampsia or hypertensive disorders in general are concerned. Right down from our communities where we have our chief compounds, if you look at our health system, the role that the community health practitioners play in the, at, at that very level, identifying cases, being able to educate these women to appreciate what they should look out for is integral. And then even when, the patient, when these clients have been identified to have hypertensive disorders, it's important to get close to them, get close to their setting, identify the societies in which they live, their backgrounds, where they are coming from. All these have to do with public health. So it's not just about the clinical aspects, but when we consider preeclampsia, eclampsia, or hypertensive disorders in general, it's important or public health, um, the, the role of public health is vital in being able to overcome the burden. Thank you. Thank you very much. How relevant is the PS model um, in our settings? Uh, I think that the PS model, the full PS model, was developed within a developed setting where institutions where there are lab, laboratory devices that can do various labs. And I think that in Ghana here, it can be relevant, especially in the bigger institutions like the whole teaching hospital, bigger hospital, regional hospitals where there are live devices that they can do their labs and then, uh, and, and then determine the various values of this patient. However, we have learned some lessons in the past that we can no longer pick a research work that was done in a developed setting and then apply it directly in the developing setting because our local settings are completely different. 
And so this full peer study needs to be validated in our settings. And when it is validated and we see that yes, the parameters apply, then it can become a standard of care that we can say that yes, everybody should do this test. And then when you do it, depending on the values you find, this is what the next step should be. Thank you very much. The, the main thing I'm saying is that it can be relevant, but it needs to be validated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I don't think we are having no bad syndrome when they call us for a referral. The problem is with regard to this hepatitis disorder, pregnancy with complications, where they need ICU. That's why we have a problem because our ICU is very limited. So when they call, and we, we upon the, I mean, they're discussing with the rotors, and we get to know that that case need ICU. We have to call the ICU and make a remit so that the ICU will tell us that the place is full. So we have to tell the rotor to hold on for us to make rearrangement at the ICU. Sometimes you go to the ICU, you realize that some cases are quite stable and they can be moved to the world. So we have to do those arrangements done and make the bed available before we inform them that they can go ahead and bring the case. So the challenge we are having now is about the capacity of our ICU. So if our ICU can be improved and increase the capacity, I think that will do a lot of good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I think we, um, okay, we'll take our last two questions because you've been waiting for quite a while. And, uh, <laughs> right. Um, um, yeah, the, uh, as, a, as, as your question been answered, the question has been answered. Okay. All right, let's, let's have you, and then, uh, um. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my name is Paulina Aduba from Home Municipal. So um, it's about the sports study. Um, doctor mentioned about pollution as some of the risk factors. I would want to find out, do you have any hypothetical substance that we are looking at? Because when we talk about pollution, it's quite broad. So is there any substance that we are really uh, envisaging may, maybe um, uh, causes of uh, pre-eclampsia that we, we are looking at today? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I think Prof, you have the last, uh, you have the last uh, question and then uh, we will listen to the answers. Yeah. I'm sure you have a lot of questions and during the break, Hopefully you will interact with the speakers and you can ask them. And then uh, in the second session, the next session we'll have more to discuss. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. I am uh, Professor Oluwashion Omotayo, head of the Department of Sports and Exercise in Medical Science. My concern is that this symposium is about an issue, health issue, which of course we want to find solution to. And I've not seen any presentation that is looking at preventive measures of such um, uh, occurrence in pregnant uh, hypertension in pregnant women. So I just want to ask any of the speakers, are they considering exercise as medicine, as preventive medicine in the matter of um, hypertension in pregnant uh, women? Thank you very much. I've been asked to answer the first question. Um, my name is Dr. Joyce Brown. I'm a, a researcher from the University Medical Center Utrecht in the Netherlands, and together with Dr. Schroff and Yao, the PI on the spot studies. So the question about environmental pollutions and what we're looking into, I'm, I'm really happy you asked because environmental 
um, aspects and environmental determinants of health are important, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa and especially in Ghana, where we don't know that many things about the impacts on health, even though we know we're exposed to environmental pollution regularly, only think about standing in traffic and all the fumes that you breathe in. So what we will be looking at are um, is data collected by the group of Raphael Arku. He is a environmental epidemiologist at University of Massachusetts and originally from Ghana. He mapped in the greater Accra region number of environmental exposures. So one is PM, PM 2.5. So the small particulates that are in, uh, air, in air pollution and are primarily one of the main responsible for ill health. And we know high exposure levels is associated with adverse outcomes for mother and child, including hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. We'll also be looking at the use of um, cooking fuel because cooking fuel produces, for example, small particles that also affects health. And we've shown this also in previous research that Dr. Bonsafa was also part of. Um, other um, environmental polluters that he's looked into is also noise pollution uh, and a number of others. And what I will do is in the chat and in the platform where you registered, share a number of references to this. So if you're interested, you can also reach out directly to him. And I know he's quite eager to collaborate with others to look into environmental exposures. Thank you. Thank you very much. There was a question on prevention. What are we doing? We have not made adequate presentations on prevention. Um, you know, this is a disease that we have a lot of theories about the root causes of the disease are not well known yet. And that is why we don't have so many papers on prevention. However, we spoke about prediction, those who we can predict the disease in so that we can give them appropriate medications like soluble aspirin. And we've also even spoken about calcium, increasing, giving them adequate calcium during the pregnancy to reduce the risk of the presence of the condition. Uh, you did mention uh, something like exercise. You know, in pregnant women, uh, I'm not sure how, what exercise regimes that we can put them on because the pregnancy to itself is heavy and exercise may be a bit risky and dangerous for them. Maybe gentle walking exercises, yes, they can carry them out. But there are a lot of preventive measures that are also on board. Uh, for example, I talk about the use of calcium, and I talk also about the use of soluble aspirin and many other, uh, other interventions. I believe in due course, all these will come onto the table. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think when you have a break, there are posters, presentation outside there. Uh, we we'll go through, and one of them is a case series where we try to look at three cases who have repetitive uh, preeclampsia in the previous pregnancy and lost their mothers and lost their babies. Mothers alive, and they were still looking for the baby, and how we manage them. In order to prevent the, I mean, the recurrence of a preeclampsia, that in the subsequent pregnancy, they didn't have the preeclampsia. Some of them lost two, three with the preeclampsia. But the subsequent pregnancy, they were not able to have the preeclampsia because we took them through pre conception care, which is not well organized in Ghana yet. We are advocating that if these women are taken through pre conception care and they are sought out medical condition in them before they, got, they get pregnant, Probably the outcome may be better. Of course, case series is to provoke thinking, argument, for us to organize or, or get a well organized research to find out. So when we go out there, we read and look at them and write that all the three were not able to develop preeclampsia before the baby were delivered. So it takes pre care, multidisciplinary management approach, close monitoring, and timely delivery. And the, we say the life of the mothers and the babies. That's the one way of preventing the complications. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. You want to? 
yeah, you realize that we also spoke about primary prevention, secondary prevention, and then tertiary prevention. And the area of primary prevention is what we said we will give maybe certain medications like calcium, soluble aspirin, when you know that the person is at risk. But even when we talk about secondary prevention and tertiary prevention, these are also preventive measures. For example, detecting the disease early, in the early stages, where complications had not yet set in, so that you can manage such a woman and avoid development of complication, it's also a preventive measure. Now, even improving quality of care for those who have complications to make sure that at the end of the day, they survive either by themselves or even with their baby is also preventive measure at the tertiary level. So that is tertiary prevention. So we are looking at the whole condition in a very holistic manner, talking about primary prevention, secondary prevention, and also tertiary prevention. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. I believe we've had, uh, uh, we've been fed and uh, we are now going to have a break and then the conversation will continue. The conversation will continue. Um, you can ask the speakers questions. Now, we're gonna have a coffee break now and it's in the basement. The basement is you go out uh, this way through this door. You can also go through the other end. Well, you go through this door and then you enter uh, on, the, on the left hand side. And in the basement, we have some tea and coffee and small chops, as well as the posters that Dr. Da mentioned. Very, very important. So you can go and please view the posters and make notes and learn something from them. Uh, there is going to be an assessment of the posters and the best poster will be given an award later on in this conference. So uh, it will be good for you to just have a look at the posters. Speakers uh, will wait here whilst the uh, uh, participants go out. So uh, the conference is in recess now. Thank you very much. Ah, yes, I forgot one, one other thing. Um, we want to take a picture of all of us in this conference. Uh, so we're gonna do a quick uh, photo, photograph take. Uh, and I think we were thinking that it might be, I don't know, where are the photographers? We want to have the whole, we want to capture all conference attendees. And we were thinking that if we took the picture with participants standing uh, on that side, it might, it might be good. Um, so uh, that's what we, we are thinking of doing. And then the speakers will be at the front. Right, okay. So uh, where are the photographers? Very quick, quick. All right. And then move, move towards the center, please. Yeah. Yeah. Just move towards the center. Yeah. Yeah. You can stand in the aisles as well, on whichever row you are on. Yeah. Okay. Ah. Okay. 
Preeclampsia, seven symptoms every pregnant woman should know. If you're pregnant, you and your baby are at risk for a life-threatening condition called preeclampsia. Preeclampsia affects one of every 12 pregnancies. Preeclampsia, seven symptoms every pregnant woman should know. If you're pregnant, you and your baby are at risk for a life-threatening condition called preeclampsia. Preeclampsia affects one of every 12 pregnancies and can cause seizures, stroke, and organ damage for mom and premature birth for the baby. Both mom and baby could die. Globally, preeclampsia and related disorders are responsible for 76,000 maternal and 500,000 infant deaths each year. This condition is related to blood pressure and can happen to any pregnant woman, especially during the second half of her pregnancy or up to six weeks after delivery. Preeclampsia can strike quickly, so it's important to know the symptoms and report them to your healthcare provider as soon as you notice them. If you experience any of the following symptoms, call your doctor or midwife right away. One, swelling of the face, especially around the eyes and swelling of the hands. Swelling of the feet is more common in late pregnancy and probably not a sign of preeclampsia. Two, Weight gain of more than five pounds in one week. Three, headache that won't go away, even after taking medication for pain relief. Four, changes in vision like seeing spots or flashing lights, partial or total loss of eyesight. Five, nausea or throwing up, especially suddenly after mid-pregnancy. Not the morning sickness that many women experience in early pregnancy. Six, upper right belly pain, sometimes mistaken for indigestion or the flu. Seven, difficulty breathing, gasping, or panting. Having symptoms doesn't necessarily mean you have preeclampsia. 
but they are cause for concern and require immediate medical evaluation. It is also important to know that some women with preeclampsia have no symptoms. The only way your doctor can diagnose it is by monitoring your blood pressure and protein in your urine, so keep up with all your prenatal appointments. Preeclampsia can also impact your long-term health. It's a risk factor for heart disease and stroke. Be sure to tell all your doctors, present and future, if you have a history of preeclampsia. Now that you know the symptoms, spread the word. Take the preeclampsia pledge, know the symptoms, spread the word. Brought to you by the Preeclampsia Foundation. Learn more at www.preeclampsia.org. 321-421-6957. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and LinkedIn. Preeclampsia, seven symptoms every pregnant woman should know. If you're pregnant, you and your baby are at risk for a life-threatening condition called preeclampsia. Preeclampsia affects one of every 12 pregnancies and can cause seizures, stroke, and organ damage for mom and premature birth to the baby. Both mom and baby could die. Globally, preeclampsia and related disorders are responsible for 76,000 maternal and 500,000 infant deaths each year. This condition is related to blood pressure and can happen to any pregnant woman, especially during the second half of her pregnancy or up to six weeks after delivery. Preeclampsia can strike quickly, so it's important to know the symptoms and report them to your healthcare provider as soon as you notice them. If you experience any of the following symptoms, Call your doctor or midwife right away. One, swelling of the face, especially around the eyes and swelling of the hands. Swelling of the feet is more common in late pregnancy and probably not a sign of preeclampsia. Two, weight gain of more than five pounds in one week. Three, headache that won't go away, even after taking medication for pain relief. Four, changes in vision like seeing spots or flashing lights, partial or total loss of eyesight. 5. Nausea or throwing up, especially suddenly after mid-pregnancy. Not the morning sickness that many women experience in early pregnancy. 6. Upper right belly pain, sometimes mistaken for indigestion or the flu. 7. Difficulty breathing, gasping, or panting. Having symptoms doesn't necessarily mean you have preeclampsia, but they are cause for concern and require immediate medical evaluation. It is also important to know that some women with preeclampsia have no symptoms. The only way your doctor can diagnose it is by monitoring your blood pressure and protein in your urine, so keep up with all your prenatal appointments. Preeclampsia can also impact your long-term health. It's a risk factor for heart disease and stroke. Be sure to tell all your doctors, present and future, if you have a history of preeclampsia. Now that you know the symptoms, spread the word. Take the preeclampsia pledge, know the symptoms, spread the word. Brought to you by the Preeclampsia Foundation. Learn more at www.preeclampsia.org. 321-421-6957. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and LinkedIn. Preeclampsia, seven symptoms every pregnant woman should know. If you're pregnant, you and your baby are at risk for a life-threatening condition called preeclampsia. Preeclampsia affects one of every 12 pregnancies and can cause seizures, stroke, and organ damage for mom and premature birth to the baby. Both mom and baby could die. Globally, preeclampsia and related disorders are responsible for 76,000 maternal and 500,000 infant deaths each year. This condition is related to blood pressure and can happen to any pregnant woman, especially during the second half of her pregnancy or up to six weeks after delivery. Preeclampsia can strike quickly, so it's important to know the symptoms and report them to your healthcare provider as soon as you notice them. If you experience any of the following symptoms, call your doctor or midwife right away. One, swelling of the face, especially around the eyes and swelling of the hands. Swelling of the feet is more common in late pregnancy and probably not a sign of preeclampsia. Two, weight gain of more than five pounds in one week. Three, 
headache that won't go away, even after taking medication for pain relief. Four, changes in vision like seeing spots or flashing lights, partial or total loss of eyesight. Five, nausea or throwing up, especially suddenly after mid-pregnancy. Not the morning sickness that many women experience in early pregnancy. Six, upper right belly pain, sometimes mistaken for indigestion or the flu. Seven, difficulty breathing, gasping, or panting. Having symptoms doesn't necessarily mean you have preeclampsia, but they are cause for concern and require immediate medical evaluation. It is also important to know that some women with preeclampsia have no symptoms. The only way your doctor can diagnose it is by monitoring your blood pressure and protein in your urine, so keep up with all your prenatal appointments. Preeclampsia can also impact your long-term health. It's a risk factor for heart disease and stroke. Be sure to tell all your doctors, present and future, if you have a history of preeclampsia. Now that you know the symptoms, spread the word. Take the preeclampsia pledge, know the symptoms, spread the word. Brought to you by the Preeclampsia Foundation. Learn more at www.preeclampsia.org. 321-421-6957. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and LinkedIn. Preeclampsia, seven symptoms every pregnant woman should know. If you're pregnant, you and your baby are at risk for a life-threatening condition called preeclampsia. Preeclampsia affects one of every 12 pregnancies and can cause seizures, stroke, and organ damage for mom and premature birth to the baby. Both mom and baby could die. Globally, preeclampsia and related disorders are responsible for 76,000 maternal and 500,000 infant deaths each year. This condition is related to blood pressure and can happen to any pregnant woman, especially during the second half of her pregnancy or up to six weeks after delivery. Preeclampsia can strike quickly, so it's important to know the symptoms and report them to your healthcare provider as soon as you notice them. If you experience any of the following symptoms, Call your doctor or midwife right away. One, swelling of the face, especially around the eyes and swelling of the hands. Swelling of the feet is more common in late pregnancy and probably not a sign of preeclampsia. Two, weight gain of more than five pounds in one week. Three, headache that won't go away even after taking medication for pain relief. Four, changes in vision like seeing spots or flashing lights, partial or total loss of eyesight. Five, nausea or throwing up, especially suddenly after mid-pregnancy. Not the morning sickness that many women experience in early pregnancy. Six, upper right belly pain, sometimes mistaken for indigestion or the flu. Seven, difficulty breathing, gasping, or panting. Having symptoms doesn't necessarily mean you have preeclampsia, but they are cause for concern and require immediate medical evaluation. It is also important to know that some women with preeclampsia have no symptoms. The only way your doctor can diagnose it is by monitoring your blood pressure and protein in your urine, so keep up with all your prenatal appointments. Preeclampsia can also impact your long-term health. It's a risk factor for heart disease and stroke. Be sure to tell all your doctors, present and future, if you have a history of preeclampsia. Now that you know the symptoms, spread the word. Take the preeclampsia pledge, know the symptoms, spread the word. Brought to you by the Preeclampsia Foundation. Learn more at www.preeclampsia.org. 321-421-6957. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and LinkedIn. Preeclampsia, seven symptoms every pregnant woman should know. If you're pregnant, you and your baby are at risk for a life-threatening condition called preeclampsia. Preeclampsia affects one of every 12 pregnancies and can cause seizures, stroke, and organ damage for mom and premature birth to the baby. Both mom and baby could die. Globally, preeclampsia and related disorders are responsible for 76,000 maternal and 500,000 infant deaths each year. This condition is related to blood pressure and can happen to any pregnant woman, especially during the second half of her pregnancy or up to six weeks after delivery. 
Preeclampsia can strike quickly, so it's important to know the symptoms and report them to your healthcare provider as soon as you notice them. If you experience any of the following symptoms, call your doctor or midwife right away. One, swelling of the face, especially around the eyes and swelling of the hands. Swelling of the feet is more common in late pregnancy and probably not a sign of preeclampsia. Two, weight gain of more than five pounds in one week. Three, headache that won't go away, even after taking medication for pain relief. Four, changes in vision like seeing spots or flashing lights, partial or total loss of eyesight. Five, nausea or throwing up, especially suddenly after mid-pregnancy. Not the morning sickness that many women experience in early pregnancy. Six, upper right belly pain, sometimes mistaken for indigestion or the flu. Seven, difficulty breathing, gasping, or panting. Having symptoms doesn't necessarily mean you have preeclampsia, but they are cause for concern and require immediate medical evaluation. It is also important to know that some women with preeclampsia have no symptoms. The only way your doctor can diagnose it is by monitoring your blood pressure and protein in your urine, so keep up with all your prenatal appointments. Preeclampsia can also impact your long-term health. It's a risk factor for heart disease and stroke. Be sure to tell all your doctors, present and future, if you have a history of preeclampsia. Now that you know the symptoms, spread the word. Take the preeclampsia pledge, know the symptoms, spread the word. Brought to you by the Preeclampsia Foundation. Learn more at www.preeclampsia.org. 321-421-6957. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and LinkedIn. Preeclampsia, seven symptoms every pregnant woman should know. If you're pregnant, you and your baby are at risk for a life-threatening condition called preeclampsia. Preeclampsia affects one of every 12 pregnancies and can cause seizures, stroke, and organ damage for mom and premature birth for the baby. Both mom and baby could die. Globally, preeclampsia and related disorders are responsible for 76,000 maternal and 500,000 infant deaths each year. This condition is related to blood pressure and can happen to any pregnant woman, especially during the second half of her pregnancy or up to six weeks after delivery. Preeclampsia can strike quickly, so it's important to know the symptoms and report them to your healthcare provider as soon as you notice them. If you experience any of the following symptoms, Call your doctor or midwife right away. One, swelling of the face, especially around the eyes and swelling of the hands. Swelling of the feet is more common in late pregnancy and probably not a sign of preeclampsia. Two, weight gain of more than five pounds in one week. Three, headache that won't go away even after taking medication for pain relief. Four, changes in vision like seeing spots or flashing lights, partial or total loss of eyesight. Five, nausea or throwing up, especially suddenly after mid-pregnancy. Not the morning sickness that many women experience in early pregnancy. Six, upper right belly pain, sometimes mistaken for indigestion or the flu. Seven, difficulty breathing, gasping, or panting. Having symptoms doesn't necessarily mean you have preeclampsia, but they are cause for concern and require immediate medical evaluation. It is also important to know that some women with preeclampsia have no symptoms. The only way your doctor can diagnose it is by monitoring your blood pressure and protein in your urine, so keep up with all your prenatal appointments. Preeclampsia can also impact your long-term health. It's a risk factor for heart disease and stroke. Be sure to tell all your doctors, present and future, if you have a history of preeclampsia. Now that you know the symptoms, spread the word. Take the preeclampsia pledge, know the symptoms, spread the word. Brought to you by the Preeclampsia Foundation. Learn more at www.preeclampsia.org. 321-421-6957. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and LinkedIn. Preeclampsia, seven symptoms every pregnant woman should know. If you're pregnant, you and your baby are at risk for a life-threatening condition called preeclampsia.
Preeclampsia affects one of every 12 pregnancies and can cause seizures, stroke, and organ damage for mom and premature birth for the baby. Both mom and baby could die. Globally, preeclampsia and related disorders are responsible for 76,000 maternal and 500,000 infant deaths each year. This condition is related to blood pressure and can happen to any pregnant woman, especially during the second half of her pregnancy or up to six weeks after delivery. Preeclampsia can strike quickly, so it's important to know the symptoms and report them to your healthcare provider as soon as you notice them. If you experience any of the following symptoms, call your doctor or midwife right away. One, swelling of the face, especially around the eyes and swelling of the hands. Swelling of the feet is more common in late pregnancy and probably not a sign of preeclampsia. Two, weight gain of more than five pounds in one week. Three, headache that won't go away, even after taking medication for pain relief. Four, changes in vision like seeing spots or flashing lights, partial or total loss of eyesight. Five, nausea or throwing up, especially suddenly after mid-pregnancy not the morning sickness that many women experience in early pregnancy. Six, upper right belly pain, sometimes mistaken for indigestion or the flu. Seven, difficulty breathing, gasping, or panting. Having symptoms doesn't necessarily mean you have preeclampsia, but they are cause for concern and require immediate medical evaluation. It is also important to know that some women with preeclampsia have no symptoms. The only way your doctor can diagnose it is by monitoring your blood pressure and protein in your urine, so keep up with all your prenatal appointments. Preeclampsia can also impact your long-term health. It's a risk factor for heart disease and stroke. Be sure to tell all your doctors, present and future, if you have a history of preeclampsia. Now that you know the symptoms, spread the word. Take the preeclampsia pledge, know the symptoms, spread the word. Brought to you by the Preeclampsia Foundation. Learn more at www.preeclampsia.org. 321-421-6957. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and LinkedIn. Preeclampsia, seven symptoms every pregnant woman should know. If you're pregnant, you and your baby are at risk for a life-threatening condition called preeclampsia. Preeclampsia affects one of every 12 pregnancies and can cause seizures, stroke, and organ damage for mom and premature birth for the baby. Both mom and baby could die. Globally, preeclampsia and related disorders are responsible for 76,000 maternal and 500,000 infant deaths each year. This condition is related to blood pressure and can happen to any pregnant woman, especially during the second half of her pregnancy or up to six weeks after delivery. Preeclampsia can strike quickly, so it's important to know the symptoms and report them to your healthcare provider as soon as you notice them. If you experience any of the following symptoms, call your doctor or midwife right away. One, swelling of the face, especially around the eyes and swelling of the hands. Swelling of the feet is more common in late pregnancy and probably not a sign of preeclampsia. Two, weight gain of more than five pounds in one week. Three, headache that won't go away even after taking medication for pain relief. Four, changes in vision like seeing spots or flashing lights, partial or total loss of eyesight. Five, nausea or throwing up, especially suddenly after mid-pregnancy. Not the morning sickness that many women experience in early pregnancy. Six, upper right belly pain, sometimes mistaken for indigestion or the flu. Seven, difficulty breathing, gasping, or panting. Having symptoms doesn't necessarily mean you have preeclampsia, but they are cause for concern and require immediate medical evaluation. It is also important to know that some women with preeclampsia have no symptoms. The only way your doctor can diagnose it is by monitoring your blood pressure and protein in your urine, so keep up with all your prenatal appointments. Preeclampsia can also impact your long-term health. It's a risk factor for heart disease and stroke. Be sure to tell all your doctors, present and future, if you have a history of preeclampsia. Now that you know the symptoms, spread the word. Take the preeclampsia pledge, 
know the symptoms, spread the word. Brought to you by the Preeclampsia Foundation. Learn more at www.preeclampsia.org. 321-421-6957. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and LinkedIn. Preeclampsia, seven symptoms every pregnant woman should know. If you're pregnant, you and your baby are at risk for a life-threatening condition called preeclampsia. Preeclampsia affects one of every 12 pregnancies and can cause seizures, stroke, and organ damage for mom and premature birth to the baby. Both mom and baby could die. Globally, preeclampsia and related disorders are responsible for 76,000 maternal and 500,000 infant deaths each year. This condition is related to blood pressure and can happen to any pregnant woman, especially during the second half of her pregnancy or up to six weeks after delivery. Preeclampsia can strike quickly, so it's important to know the symptoms and report them to your healthcare provider as soon as you notice them. If you experience any of the following symptoms, call your doctor or midwife right away. One, swelling of the face, especially around the eyes and swelling of the hands. Swelling of the feet is more common in late pregnancy and probably not a sign of preeclampsia. Two, weight gain of more than five pounds in one week. Three, headache that won't go away, even after taking medication for pain relief. Four, changes in vision like seeing spots or flashing lights, partial or total loss of eyesight. Five, nausea or throwing up, especially suddenly after mid-pregnancy not the morning sickness that many women experience in early pregnancy. Six, upper right belly pain, sometimes mistaken for indigestion or the flu. Seven, difficulty breathing, gasping, or panting. Having symptoms doesn't necessarily mean you have preeclampsia, but they are cause for concern and require immediate medical evaluation. It is also important to know that some women with preeclampsia have no symptoms. The only way your doctor can diagnose it is by monitoring your blood pressure and protein in your urine, so keep up with all your prenatal appointments. Preeclampsia can also impact your long-term health. It's a risk factor for heart disease and stroke. Be sure to tell all your doctors, present and future, if you have a history of preeclampsia. Now that you know the symptoms, spread the word. Take the preeclampsia pledge, know the symptoms, spread the word. Brought to you by the Preeclampsia Foundation. Learn more at www.preeclampsia.org. 321-421-6957. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and LinkedIn. Preeclampsia, seven symptoms every pregnant woman should know. If you're pregnant, you and your baby are at risk for a life-threatening condition called preeclampsia. Preeclampsia affects one of every 12 pregnancies and can cause seizures, stroke, and organ damage for mom and premature birth to the baby. Both mom and baby could die. Globally, preeclampsia and related disorders are responsible for 76,000 maternal and 500,000 infant deaths each year. This condition is related to blood pressure and can happen to any pregnant woman, especially during the second half of her pregnancy or up to six weeks after delivery. Preeclampsia can strike quickly, so it's important to know the symptoms and report them to your healthcare provider as soon as you notice them. If you experience any of the following symptoms, call your doctor or midwife right away. One, swelling of the face, especially around the eyes and swelling of the hands. Swelling of the feet is more common in late pregnancy and probably not a sign of preeclampsia. Two, weight gain of more than five pounds in one week. Three, headache that won't go away even after taking medication for pain relief. Four, changes in vision like seeing spots or flashing lights, partial or total loss of eyesight. Five, nausea or throwing up, especially suddenly after mid-pregnancy not the morning sickness that many women experience in early pregnancy. Six, upper right belly pain, sometimes mistaken for indigestion or the flu. Seven, difficulty breathing, gasping, or panting. Having symptoms doesn't necessarily mean you have preeclampsia, but they are cause for concern 
and require immediate medical evaluation. It is also important to know that some women with preeclampsia have no symptoms. The only way your doctor can diagnose it is by monitoring your blood pressure and protein in your urine, so keep up with all your prenatal appointments. Preeclampsia can also impact your long-term health. It's a risk factor for heart disease and stroke. Be sure to tell all your doctors, present and future, if you have a history of preeclampsia. Now that you know the symptoms, spread the word. Take the preeclampsia pledge, know the symptoms, spread the word. Brought to you by the Preeclampsia Foundation. Learn more at www.preeclampsia.org. 321-421-6957. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and LinkedIn. Preeclampsia, seven symptoms every pregnant woman should know. If you're pregnant, you and your baby are at risk for a life-threatening condition called preeclampsia. Preeclampsia affects one of every 12 pregnancies and can cause seizures, stroke, and organ damage for mom and premature birth to the baby. Both mom and baby could die. Globally, preeclampsia and related disorders are responsible for 76,000 maternal and 500,000 infant deaths each year. This condition is related to blood pressure and can happen to any pregnant woman, especially during the second half of her pregnancy or up to six weeks after delivery. Preeclampsia can strike quickly, so it's important to know the symptoms and report them to your healthcare provider as soon as you notice them. If you experience any of the following symptoms, call your doctor or midwife right away. One, swelling of the face, especially around the eyes and swelling of the hands. Swelling of the feet is more common in late pregnancy and probably not a sign of preeclampsia. Two, weight gain of more than five pounds in one week. Three, headache that won't go away even after taking medication for pain relief. Four, changes in vision like seeing spots or flashing lights, partial or total loss of eyesight. Five, nausea or throwing up, especially suddenly after mid-pregnancy. Not the morning sickness that many women experience in early pregnancy. Six, upper right belly pain, sometimes mistaken for indigestion or the flu. Seven, difficulty breathing, gasping, or panting. Having symptoms doesn't necessarily mean you have preeclampsia, but they are cause for concern and require immediate medical evaluation. It is also important to know that some women with preeclampsia have no symptoms. The only way your doctor can diagnose it is by monitoring your blood pressure and protein in your urine, so keep up with all your prenatal appointments. Preeclampsia can also impact your long-term health. It's a risk factor for heart disease and stroke. Be sure to tell all your doctors, present and future, if you have a history of preeclampsia. Now that you know the symptoms, spread the word. Take the preeclampsia pledge, know the symptoms, spread the word. Brought to you by the Preeclampsia Foundation. Learn more at www.preeclampsia.org. 321-421-6957. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and LinkedIn. Preeclampsia, seven symptoms every pregnant woman should know. If you're pregnant, you and your baby are at risk for a life-threatening condition called preeclampsia. Preeclampsia affects one of every 12 pregnancies and can cause seizures, stroke, and organ damage for mom and premature birth to the baby. Both mom and baby could die. Globally, preeclampsia and related disorders are responsible for 76,000 maternal and 500,000 infant deaths each year. This condition is related to blood pressure and can happen to any pregnant woman, especially during the second half of her pregnancy or up to six weeks after delivery. Preeclampsia can strike quickly, so it's important to know the symptoms and report them to your healthcare provider as soon as you notice them. If you experience any of the following symptoms, call your doctor or midwife right away. One, swelling of the face, especially around the eyes and swelling of the hands. Swelling of the feet is more common in late pregnancy and probably not a sign of preeclampsia. Two, weight gain of more than five pounds in one week. Three, headache that won't go away even after taking medication for pain relief. 
Four, changes in vision like seeing spots or flashing lights, partial or total loss of eyesight. Five, nausea or throwing up, especially suddenly after mid-pregnancy. Not the morning sickness that many women experience in early pregnancy. Six, upper right belly pain, sometimes mistaken for indigestion or the flu. Seven, difficulty breathing, gasping, or panting. Having symptoms doesn't necessarily mean you have preeclampsia, but they are cause for concern and require immediate medical evaluation. It is also important to know that some women with preeclampsia have no symptoms. The only way your doctor can diagnose it is by monitoring your blood pressure and protein in your urine. So keep up with all your prenatal appointments. Preeclampsia can also impact your long-term health. It's a risk factor for heart disease and stroke. Be sure to tell all your doctors, present and future, if you have a history of preeclampsia. Now that you know the symptoms, spread the word. Take the preeclampsia pledge, know the symptoms, spread the word. Brought to you by the Preeclampsia Foundation.
Every time I look at mama, I see the woman, a wonderful woman, an African woman, mother of nature. Oh, 
Seven symptoms every pregnant woman should know. If you're pregnant, you and your baby are at A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming back after the coffee break. In many conferences, you lose people after a break, but we, we thank you that you, are, you have been faithful and you are back with us. We want to go on with the next sessions of our conference today but before we do that we have a group here who want to demonstrate briefly to us what we call the group care concept so we would give attention to the gcd 1000 project the maternal and child health project way far from where binduri binduri in the upper east region they are here to show their solidarity with us and realize that group care is very important, even for hypertensive diseases and pregnancies. So we would welcome their leader, Jedida Abanga, to help us with this demonstration. And she tells me she will need volunteers. So please, let me see some willing volunteers in the house. Let's give a round of applause to GC1000 Project. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, please. I'll need uh, eight volunteers. So once you come, I'll just give a brief uh, background to the project. Yeah, the GC1000 project is an implementation research project in the Upper East region of Ghana, Binduri specifically. And it is based on the centering care model, which has been uh, practiced in other parts of the, country, the world, but not in Ghana specifically. And like Doc said in his presentation, we did not just pick a concept and then bring it here. We needed to do a rapid assessment, find out what the local problems were, tailored group care to fit it. So we included a small diagnostic backpack known as the Check Together, which it aims to, in, um, for early risk detection in pregnancy, it takes the history and then with basic diagnosis like uh, HB, which is non-invasive, urine dipsticks for protein, and then the BP. And then together, it's the, app, it's the, mid, the midwife puts all those into an app that has been provided, and then she gets a decision support as to what to do with the midwife, to do with the client. And then there are three components to it, which is the health assessment component, which involves taking the vital signs and then doing the palpation and all that. And then we have the group discussion component and then the community building. So we are here to demonstrate the group discussion component as to how we do it. Because uh, in, in the century model, it is believed that you let the participants share their experiences, bring the knowledge they know, and then the midwife facilitates whatever knowledge and then adds on to that. So that is how the century model is done. So my eight volunteers. <laughs> Males, females, students, nurses, professors, volunteers. Please just stand behind the, yes, yes, yes. Thank please. you, thank you, you are wonderful. <laughs> I can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's clap for them. Thank you. So today we would, we would be discussing nutrition in our group discussion. So we have a basket here that is made up of all kinds of foods and chemicals. So you just pick one, whatever you want, just pick it. Ah, someone should pick that.
So, you know, as pregnant women, it's very important to take care of your, your diet. You should eat very well and eat most appropriately. So you have different types of, different categories of food we are holding now. So uh, I would like you to put them within these three calyx. Red is for things that are not supposed to be eaten whilst you are pregnant. Yellow, things you, you are not too sure of, don't know whether you're supposed to eat it or not. And then green, things that are allowed to be eaten during pregnancy. So just go ahead and put them. <laughs> so, uh, can you this year? So, can you tell me why you put it there? Okay, I put it there because it's uh, nutritious, contains a lot of fiber that will help the woman, and it's a vegetable. Does anyone has anything else to add? Yes. On, on what she said, yes. You all agree with her that uh, contumere is very nutritious, contains fiber, and is good for a woman with who is pregnant. Great, thank you. And uh, is there anything you don't agree that it should be here? Yes. The biscuits. Okay. Yeah. The sugar content is high, even though uh, it, it gives the person appetite and all that, but the nutritional level is lower in that than the others. Okay. That's so great. I think we should move it out. <laughs> Anybody else has something to add? I also want to say that it's not entirely bad for a pregnant woman to eat biscuits, great. but in moderation, it's good for the pregnant woman. Perfect. Time. That is great. Yeah. So, um, uh, who puts this here? Yes. Your reason? This is alcohol. And we all know that alcohol is not good for a pregnant woman. And for the baby, the unborn fetus. So I think it is no good for a pregnant woman to take alcohol. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody has something else to add from the group? I, I want to say that alcohol doesn't have any nutrients. And as a pregnant woman continues to take it, she will become addicted to it and she can deliver a baby with alcohol syndrome. Yeah, so you are all perfectly right. It's true, alcohol. Dawa, dawa. Yes, it's nutritious, yes. <laughs> so yes, so uh, this is just a quick demonstration on how it is done in the groups. So if anything, the person sure of i probably think this should be in moderation you could put it here and then you say oh we think this can be taken but it should be in moderation and once you are facilitating and you think that you have a problem for example the there is an issue of let's say taking on prescribed drugs by pregnant women within your community even though none of them picked it you could pick it and find out from them where do you put it then you discuss it because you want it to be discussed Thank you so much. Thank you very much, GC1000 project. This is very innovative, looking for innovative ways that we can reach our women with the educational messages that we give them every day at the ANC, instead of giving them a talk, you know, a didactic talk, you stand and every day you talk, assuming they are listening, they are thinking about their child they've left in the house and with nobody to take care of, but something like this 
we'll definitely engage them. Thank you very much. We are going straight into our next session, which is titled Management of Hypertensive Disorders in Pregnancy in Ghana. Now we're looking at the role of policy and religion. Apologies from our um, Director of Policy Planning and Monitoring and Evaluation of the Ministry of Health. He cannot be with us today because he has been called into something very urgent. But we have here also representing Dr. Kofi Issa, who happens to be the Director of Family Health Division. We have Dr. Chris Fofi to speak in his stead. And just a brief uh, statement about Dr. Chris Fofi. He is a consultant obstetrician gynecologist and head of the Safe Motherhood Program at the Ghana Health Service, still under the Family Health Division. He completed his medical school in, in Cuba and continued there for his postgraduate studies in ONG. He also holds a master's in public health and has worked in the Upper West Region Regional Hospital for several years before moving to Ridge and then now to the Ghana Health Service uh, headquarters. His major interests include pelvic organ prolapse surgery and social determinants of health. Dr. Chris Fofi, please have the stage and you have 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Yes, um, let me start by saying it's a pleasure to be with you once again to discuss this topic that I find to be very. Thank you very much. I was going through some coaching here. Yes, so um, the presentation will be looking at um, system that's gonna help service or health uh, system response and how to use informed policy and guidelines to be able to improve um, hypertension disease in, or disorders in pregnancy in Ghana. So as a quick um, overview, um, we'll look at first the outline, and I'll first start with a very brief introduction, go through the intersect between um, hypertensive disorders and religion. We'll look at basis for policy consideration, the Ghana Health Service response um, to addressing the issue, and also we we'll look at some few um, recommendations, and off we go. Yes, as introduction, we see hypertensive disorders in pregnancy together has overtaken postpartum hemorrhage, which either too was the leading cause of death, obstetric death in Ghana. Now, it's also a leading cause of um, preterm uh, deliveries and early pregnancy loss. So in other words, majority of the people who do not even die from it, end up losing their babies or deliver before time. And these babies go through quite a number of challenges at the intensive care unit, which you heard most of the issues there. That comes with quite a number of social burden. As you, you can imagine a, a man moving with the wife at a point and the woman enters into an eclamptic fit. You, you fit and at the end, she loses consciousness and the response there, social society and the pressure and comments that people make after that could be quite devastating. So the, the load in terms of social 
uh, context, the suffering agony that goes with it is, is known to be quite high. Financially, hypertensive diseases come with complications that could really mean a huge financial burden to the family. Of course, when it comes to um, going for dialysis and interventions like that, it could be very expensive and most families on the ordinary might not be able to. So because of all this, we think that something more should be done about it. Now, we're looking at religion. We think that religion comes in, but um, I look at it and I see there is an intersect between uh, medical practice and religion to some extent. The first area we look at is when a woman has hypertensive disorder in pregnancy, majority of the time there could be some level, there might not be any obvious sign or symptoms, so she might think she's well. If you say she should go on admission, she doesn't see why she should do that. So she needs some level of belief, isn't it? So there's some element of fit that needs to come in before she will understand that she's really sick. So at that point, we say it's quite similar to what happens in religion. You need belief, you need faith to be able to, to do that. The next level I see here is that healthcare providers, majority of the time, come up with um, some subtle signs and symptoms to decide that, okay, this pregnancy needs to be, to be ended now. Other than that, the outcome could be devastating. The woman could die. Can you imagine the doctor says, if I don't end this pregnancy now, um, we, you could lose your life or the baby will die or anything like that happens. In that sense, we see the doctors or healthcare providers comporting in a way like prophet, isn't it? Trying to prophesy in a way and talk about cat catastrophic outcomes yet to come. In that way, we say that it's also similar to what the religious people do. Things that we don't see, they come out and they have a clear idea about how it should happen. Also, we look at another intersect here where care providers who say, if we do not intervene now, the outcome will be bad. When that happens, if a woman decides that I will agree and have the intervention, the woman will not really know if the event will have happened at all. However, if you disagree with the doctors and say, all right, I will not accept the intervention, that is not the way out either because you might not know if the event will have happened because it's very possible that you could die before knowing that the intervention has really happened. So to some extent, some level of fit with, is woven through all these phases of um, medical care as we go. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that care providers and the religious leaders, spiritual support, we are all doing the same thing. We are using quite similar techniques and therefore there should be an intersect, a way to collaborate and have most of the things we do work together. So in this modern age that we have quite an information boom, that simply means that we should be able to have the information available. And that also is another area I can say is just like in the religion, the old era where the Bible was only available to the priests who could read it. Today there's information, the Bible is on your, lap, on your laptop, it's on your phone, you can read the same way the information about preeclampsia is available. All we have to do is to look at it. And that brings into mind a common chapter like Matthew 7, 7, that says, you should ask, you shall be given, seek, you will find, knock, it shall be open. All we have to do is to make sure we have the available knowledge and with that, we might be able to improve the care we provide to our client. So with that, let's look at some few policy considerations here. We're saying that they have been concerned across board over the years that um, yes, um, some care providers pay very little attention to spiritual needs of their client, disregarding completely the need for a spiritual intervention when it comes to the management of preeclampsia. That on its own has put in quite a number of clients off the healthcare system and the outcomes have been catastrophic. On the other hand, we also have had cases where clients have disregarded medical care and gone straight away to prayer camps, like in the situation of Fafa and the outcome we all know was quite catastrophic. Apart from that, we've had reports in the media space where uh, young women have gone to prayer camps or situations where spiritual leaders have treated people in a manner that we can all agree 
are abusive. So do we let all that continue? Do we work in silos where healthcare providers stick to all that they think is the best evidence? The spiritual people continue to do what they think is best. And then all those who appear to be, excuse me, to say charlatans who might not be really spiritual people and not medical people, then fill in the space and then abuse clients. I don't think that's the answer. There should be a way to find a second place. So how do we effectively uh, uh, manage uh, this, this piece here? We're saying that we need evidence-based medical care. And that means that the, the medical knowledge that we're providing is not static. It should be based on the best evidence possible. Years back, we were using um, a lytic uh, cocktail. And that simply means you put some substances together like opromazin, uh, prometazin, and, and petidin all together. And when a woman converts, that's all that you have to give. But through research and evaluation, we've been able to identify that that doesn't solve the problem and we need something more. And that's how come today magnesium sulfate has become the standard. So in the same way, it's very possible that within some years to come, something better than magnesium sulfate will come, will come and we'll use it. So we should be ready to change the evidence base and also be aware that our knowledge needs to be improved. So we don't, as practitioners, don't have to be so dismissive about other care providers who come into that space and try to work with them. Respect for autonomy is another thing we think is very important. Every individual has the right to determine how he wants his life to be lived. And if they have their faith, their worldview, that should be respected. So we should have a way to carve that into the health sector and the care delivery process that we offer. And that is one area we think if we work with that, we might be having a peaceful environment. Another area we're seeing that we can't leave things to happen, people to take the healthcare space and use it whichever they want. There should be guidelines, policies that will restrict people who do not pertain in that space. If you don't have the needed qualification to be able to provide care to women, there should be a way to limit you from doing that. If there is any evidence that you have abused women, we shouldn't tolerate it. And not tolerating it means all of us who have to stand against people who do things that go in contrary to the health of women. So policies have to be put in place to regulate that space so that we can have some bit of harmony. Information is important. We all talk about education, where we have so many teachers, everybody is teaching something else. Every day you go on the radio, on TV, you hear people saying things, and some of the things they say can be completely seen as unacceptable. And who regulate that? How do we make sure that the information that is available is the best? So there should be some way to address that. All right, so what has been the Ghana Health Service response into improving care for hypertensive diseases? Yes, we've seen, we've heard most of the issues that you address here, challenges all over, but my, my focus is not to look at the challenges, but I reassure you with some of the things that we're doing and hoping that we might be able to do better than that. Under human resource, we're looking at how to include, increase staff strength. And you agree with me, over the past three years, quite a number of staff have been employed into the Ghana Health System, and we're talking precisely about um, midwives. As we speak now, we have midwives um, who were either to in health centers alone now, midwives across board up to CHIPS compound. All we need is to improve the knowledge and skill level so that they'll be able to provide the very basic skills that are needed. We also find a way, so the training element is on its way. Equipment and supplies are another important thing. There's no point having midwives, nurses, doctors in hinterland without the tools to work with. So you remember during the COVID era, there was a very huge response of equipment, especially in the intensive care unit ventilators that were distributed. There is a huge drive to provide more equipment in that direction so that we can strengthen the system, especially at the higher level, to respond appropriately to the needs of, of uh, most of our clients. Already there is a system like the scheduled delivery that Ghana Health Service embarks on through which all supplies, including most of the medicines for hypertensive diseases or disorders are scheduled and delivered and can be monitored in real life through the guild mix. So that's another important thing. Yes, data is important. We're discussing outside how do how many women really suffer from hypertensive diseases? Is this something we have the data? 
how many of them die? Most of the time we can tell you, but across board, can we pinpoint how many are getting hypertensive disease every week, every month? We need to strengthen the system to be able to capture that data. And to do that, new systems have been deployed, like the light wave, which will follow individual clients across the entire pregnancy period, so that if there are problems of that nature, we can tabulate and be able to disaggregate and then pin down so that we can make decisions with all this. So these are very good things. Another response referral system, it was mentioned clearly here, most cases are referred late and all that. We might not be able to um, rely entirely on the national ambulance system alone. We have encouraging communities to come out with community approaches that include um, community transport system. Apart from that, we have an, another layer where we use telemedicine, like call centers, so that throughout people can be able to call and be able to direct traffic in meaningful ways so that we don't have so many people going to one direction and creating the no bed syndrome that we, we're talking about. Already, some of the call centers are working very well, especially UGM, Rate Hospital, and if we continue that way, we might be able to direct traffic a bit better than. And then the network of practice, which probably I won't bore you much with that now. Now, some policy considerations, we say women uh, suffering from hypertensive disorders, um, we agree that the cost element is huge. Health insurance cannot do it all. The basic is covered, but when you suffer complications requiring dialysis, requiring um, other major interventions, rehabilitation, that could be too much for the insurance and that can jeopardize our whole financial stability. So we're proposing that we could have something like preeclampsia fund where people can contribute in and that fund could be monitored only for people who have outrageous um, or we call that catastrophic medical bills and then find a way to cushion them and, and let them be able to thrive after that. So that could come as a recommendation. We have creation of uh, platforms like this event, which we find to be very useful because we have quite people from all walks of life coming in to understand and also disseminate information on preeclampsia. And you never know where some of the things we say here can get to. We go a long way to improve the way we perceive the disease and then put in practical solutions to help. So on the, on the other element of it, we say, um, we need policy guidelines that will help all providers to be able to work in this space, being um, medical people, nursing professionals, and even people outside the medical uh, era, physiotherapy, going outside that whole scope with religious background, how to provide uh, counseling, what type of counseling, psychosocial support, psychology support, all of them, there should be a way, a simple format to to, to direct our form of engagement. And that should be one of the major things that we think that we need in this country so that at the end, most of these issues can be addressed. So in conclusion, I say hypertensive disease or disorders in pregnancy continue to be a challenge to the country. Despite the ongoing interventions and strategies, we still as much that's needed to be done. So this is simply a call on all organizations, all policies, all individuals, agencies, everybody within the country to understand that as our village people say, one person cannot catch a madman. You need some level of cooperation and coercion. And all together, we might be able to stand here another day and say that hypertension disorders in pregnancy, which was, was the leading cause of death, is now no longer because we all stood up and responded to a single call from Action Preeclampsia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fofi. Thank you for a wonderful presentation and also for staying within time. We are very, very grateful. The truth is that health workers, we do a lot but we are not the only ones the clients are looking up to for solutions to their problems. And Dr. Christophe has mentioned, how do we bring the others on board to make sure that that evidence-based uh, medicine we are practicing, it's really holistic. We, we know that our clinical approaches 
to a large extent are evidence based, but their religion, their faith, which they want to bring on board, how can we incorporate it in such a way that in the end they are not abused, but we solve the problem at hand? Our next speaker is Dr. Kwame Edu Bonsafo. He's a lecturer and consultant at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Ghana Medical School and also the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. And he's also a member of the Sport Consortium. Dr. Edu Bonsafo has extensive clinical and research experience in the field of maternal and fetal medicine and management of hypertensive disorders in pregnancy and his special interests are in maternal fetal medicine. Dr. Edu Bonsafo is going to speak to us this afternoon on research agendas and respectful maternity care. Is there a role for religion in knowledge dissemination to reduce adverse maternal and perinatal outcomes? A round of applause for Dr. Bonsafo. So um, what is the Right. Thank you. Thank you. Introduction. Um, I'm very happy to do this presentation. Um, first of all, uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity given to me by APEC to do this presentation. And the title has already been mentioned. And is there a rule of um, rule for religion in knowledge dissemination instead of trying to reduce morbidities and mortality from hypertensive disorders or maternal issues? And this will be the outline. Um, we'll talk about respectful maternity care and also talk about how women are treated when they go to deliver. We have a lot of women here, so I'm sure, as I mentioned, they are thinking about a lot of things. Then we, there was a study by the WHO on how women are treated in labor. We will discuss some main findings and look at some secondary analysis of how the situation is. Then we can look at religion and matern, mat, maternity care, then we can close. So when we say respectful maternity care, it's a care, specialized care, organized for all women in a manner that it maintains their dignity and then their privacy and confidentiality and also ensures freedom from harm and mistreatment. And that also enables them to have informed choices and also to have continuous support during labor and childbirth. The question is, I'm sure somebody will ask, why are we interested in looking at respectful maternity care. It's not directly related to um, hypertensive disorders. You are right. The problem is, as you all know, hypertensive disorders, including preeclampsia, which is the prototype, a, we don't know the cause of it. So even all the things we are doing, you can still develop. I mean, we don't understand why Akusia will have it, but Ama will not have it. And so, we don't have very strong preventive measures to treat, especially to you know that is the cause. And therefore, if you don't do this, studies have shown that because we don't have that, maybe we can have another way where we can then let these women come early and therefore they can be treated. As Dr. Pupi mentioned, it surprises us why women will go to, or other people will go to spiritualists and you hear what they do to them. They say, why? Should a human being go and be subjected to that kind of treatment? Look, it's not their fault. By the time we finish the presentation, you understand why they feel like when they go there, they talk to them as brothers, sisters. They listen to them, they speak their language. And that is what women want. 
So this is the purpose of the presentation. So it directly related in this way, and you have to try to understand that. Then WHO actually um, published a trapartum guideline to say that all women should have respectful care when they are in labor, and that should be all. And situation where you talk to them well, communication. We don't communicate well. You have to give them the opportunity to have somebody they want to be with when they are in labor. We don't do that. All we say is that this is not allowed. Then we have to maintain their privacy and confidentiality. If you listen to women and they tell you what they go through, a doctor examines a patient and you see he's talking to another doctor or somebody he doesn't know about, oh, this, this, this women don't like that. And because of that, they don't want to come to us. They go to the spiritualist who say, oh, madam, sit down, I'm with you, and talk to them in a language they will understand, they listen to them, and that's the thing. I must say that focusing on only preventing maternal death and new newborn death and mobility, look, it's not enough. Because if you beat a woman and you're able to help her survive life and the child also survive, that is not enough. Because when they go out from that kind of ordeal, they won't come back because they can't imagine themselves coming back to be insulted and to be beaten and to be pinched, slapped. Some people even use instruments to pin them when they are delivering. And when they go through that, they don't want to come back. So I'm saying that we trying to say that we want to prevent deaths of mother and baby is not enough. We need to move forward. That alone is not enough. We therefore have to find a way to measure this subtle things that we, we will put it, it's not that subtle, it's big to the women, and find ways to measure and look at them and address them properly so that we don't always focus on was there a maternal mortality or a fetal death? No, we need to go beyond that. And that is what sometimes the spiritualists and traditionalists, traditional birth attendants, they do. And so even though they are killing them, the woman feels like, it. look, it doesn't matter if you are a professor or what, we see professors going to traditionalists. We see doctors going. And so we need to, look, when you are a doctor and you are even sick, you go and see your other doctor, you, are, you don't know, you give the doctor opportunity as a driver. That's how I see it. And they drive you. You don't sometimes have a say. And we need to look at this in women. And so every woman has a right to the highest attainable standard of health, which includes the right of dignified, um, care and respectful care. Let me mention that the fact of respecting women in labor is not only limited to the developing countries. No, it also occurs in the other part of the world. And there was a study in the Netherlands, and what was said was that women felt like they have lost everything, they, especially during the time they were being examined vaginally. They, they feel like doctors or midwives were insensitive it was painful, they felt psychologically traumatized. You want to examine somebody like that as a woman, you want to go to examine her vaginally, you need to show respect. She has given you everything. You need to find a way and understand her situation. Otherwise, you just go in somewhere, somebody will say, Madam, Daho, just Madam, lie down. And they just put their hand there and look. When you listen to them afterwards, what they say, it can be very, sometimes I feel very sad. And so this thing started coming up strongly in 2010, where Bowser and he decided to look at landscape analysis of the situation. And then uh, World Reborn Alliance also came in and, for, and published a charter that can ensure that all women get the care that they need in a very respectful manner. So in 2013, WHO felt that this is something that we should look at because it's not only the provision of care that you think you have given, but how did the women experience the care? How did they feel the care you provided to them? That is very important. So based on that, then WHO published um, a statement to say that there should be a way to prevent all forms of um, disrespectful care and mistreatment. And this is the beginning of the study I'm going to talk to you about. So, how did they come about? There have been situations where people have asked, why did you consider using the term mistreatment and not obstetric violence? You see, the healthcare providers who deliver this women, they don't have 
the idea of causing violence. They have an idea of trying to help, but in that process, then it turns out. So then, if you go to Latin America, that is used mostly. Then it came to respectful disrespect and abuse. And doing our study, we decided that it's better we use mistreatment. And now we have respectful care. So what was the beginning? There was a systematic review that looked at all the possible things that can constitute what we call mistreatment. And this includes things like physical abuse, pinching, slapping the thigh, slapping properly. Some of them even have canes. And then you can have verbal abuse. When a woman comes in labor, the worst that they will tell them, in fact, if they have a chance, they will go back, but they don't have anywhere to go. So they decide to stay. Next time, they might not come back. And then stigma. Some of them look at them and you have this and they don't want to treat you. Poor rapport. You, a patient comes and you want to treat them, but you don't talk to them. You just say, Madam, sit down and you are just doing anything, please. Unless we look at some of these things, we, they will not come to us. And so that's what, and then health system, I think we have been mentioned, so I won't go back to that again. So how did we start? We realized that despite the growing recognition of the situation, no effort has been made globally, actually, to look at this in a, in a very realistic manner. And so, um, therefore, we realize that this needs to be described well, put in proper context, and can be studied and can be so that solutions can be given to that. So, what we did was the main aim was to develop and validate tools that can be used to measure this because sometimes they think it's nothing. So, when that is done, then we also decided to actually study all the individual factors that are associated with this, provider factors, health system, and so forth. And this study was done in two phases. The first one was to look at a qualitative study where we listen to women and let them tell us if it is really true, they, they face this. So this study was done in Ghana. In Ghana part, we did it in Sawem and Koforidia, and this was a very revealing finding that we had. Other studies have, been also, have also been done. Then the phase two, phase two was a point where we decided that we'll get research assistant trained to observe women in labor and see what really the health workers do to them. And when we finished, we decided to follow up when they have been discharged up to about eight weeks to really ask them if they still think like they, they were treated well. And, and you can hear that women actually, even after eight weeks, are able to remember the things they, they, they went through. And that is something that we should look at. And this study was done in three countries, four countries, including Ghana, Nigeria, Myanmar, and, and Guinea. And those were some of the initial findings we got from the study. And this is a study that, this is the one part that we had in Ghana. This is one of the study we wrote in Ghana that actually the women mentioned this kind of verbal abuse, physical abuse, shouting. Sometimes they use words on you that you don't want to. And then sometimes they abandon them. When they are in labor, there was somebody who was in labor and she was calling the, the woman and she won't come. Until another patient lying by and said, the baby is a crying about, the baby is coming. Then they rushed and by the time the baby had been delivered. So these are things, but surprisingly, when we asked the women, what do they think about some of these things that are done to them? And they felt that, oh, right, okay, if they did it to save my, my baby, I don't have any problem, I think it's okay. You see, for them, they think that once we are saving the baby, but even though it pains them, next time they will not come. And so these are things that, so acceptability is a factor, and they realize that this occurs mostly during the second stage when the baby is about to come and the, everybody is running. And so this is something that we need to really consider as well. Then we tend to ask the health workers themselves and then the hospital administrators. And they actually confirm that they know they do those things to women. However, quickly, they decided to have rationalizations, reasons why they think they do that and therefore should be accepted. Things like they are understaffed, they have high workload, and they, sometimes women don't comply to instructions. And things like women, sometimes they have attitudes towards them. And so they kind of sometimes get frustrated and probably mistreat them. In terms of acceptability, these health workers, some of them thought it's right. Others thought you should never do that too. So it, it was like a misfinding. 
So the second part of the study was a situation where we wanted to look at the labor observation tool, where we observed them and also later follow them into the community. And this was the main study which we did. And you realize that the first row shows the labor observation where we recruited 2000, 28,008 women. And then the community survey, we included uh, 3,806. So 2,806 and 3,806 for those ones. And you can see the components in terms of constitution from the various countries. And what did we find? We actually found out that as much as about 41 or 42 percent of women actually experience some form of physical, verbal, or stigma, or even discrimination, and that was very big among uh, 2016 women that we studied. And you can see some of them only 14 percent had physical abuse, others had verbal abuse and these were things that actually happened to women see for the community survey and surprisingly it turned out that in this study only looking at the time that um the time that you can see 15 15 minutes to time you can see that um 15 minutes to the time of delivery that's where you had a maximum amount of the, this thing is occurring to the women. And so this is a point that we need to be very careful about. And then you look at other things, cesarean sessions, some people had cesarean sessions, they didn't, they were not talked to. Some had episiotomy, that's the operation we do to, you cut a woman to, they already say they are, you are already in pain, so you can, we can cut you, that is not too good. Some were not informed about the a vagina examination they were going to do. And that is also, you can see about 59% actually were not informed or we need to take permission from these women before we touch them, but we feel like we are the bosses. Good. And then you can see that which people actually had most problem? Young women who are less educated actually had the worst of it. And so that is something that we should be careful about. So when we see young women on marriage, when they come, those people actually go through a lot of problems. I already mentioned that. So based on that, we decided to look at the companionship to see if we can do something, satisfaction, and then vagina delivery, and see if we do vagina examination, what happens to them. So you can see that companionship is something that WHO recommends. So in Ghana, it has come to a point that we need to think about allowing women to have their parents or their couple um, their um, husbands if they want to have them there that studies have shown actually improves outcome in terms of that we decided that we wanted to look at the characteristics of the women who had that and it will surprise you that for instance in guinea women who who were who who, who didn't have companionship actually they had more problems than, than women who had companionship and about 50 percent of women actually had companionship so you can see that in terms of satisfaction, that one we wanted to explore how women had, I mean, they, how satisfied they were. And it surprised you that about one third of them reported mistreatment and 88% said they were satisfied. But when we did a further analysis, you realize that about women who were 4.5, women were 4.5 times more likely to be satisfied if they did not experience any verbal abuse and also five times more satisfied if they did not wait for that long in, in the hospital. So what are the implications? The implication is that allowing women to have companions of, of choice can be allowed. We need to look at it. And then we also have to find ways and means to work around to see how. Religion comes in here. These findings, we should tell the religious people and see how best we can collaborate with them. We don't have to leave them alone. We need to collaborate with them because the women, we are religious people and we always go there and we need to come collaborate with them and see how best we can work around that. Good, then in terms of vagina examination, 59% of them said they were not informed about, about vagina, they just entered them, that's very bad. And then 16%, their information was shared to the public, to the other people without looking at them, that was not too good. And all these things, you can see some of them 
they were the genitalia was just exposed. Doctors or they didn't really care about whether you are exposed, there was no curtain, and then they examined them. These are things that women may not want. But when they go to the spiritualists, sometimes they do that for them. They know that you need to be protected, you need to be covered and all that. So these are things that I think we should consider looking at it. So in terms of implication, our results actually highlight the need for us to ensure better communication with our patients. And also in settings where we don't even have proper, um, maybe privacy curtains can help. And then we need some of these things to help. These are the product that we can use to help intrapartum care. They need to have positive pregnancy experience before they can, um, uh, they can go on. Mary, one minute more. So before I finish, before I finish, I will not finish without talking about caring for the carers, the people who care for them. We need to look at them as well. If you want to look at the women and not looking at them, those who care for the women, it turned out that actually in Africa, about 50% of women of the midwife were actually mistreated themselves by other colleagues, being doctors, being whoever. And those ones have to be given as well, have be, has to be considered. And some are not given good care. They are not provided with where they live and all that. Those things affect them. And when they come, they have problems. So my last slide is the fact that Ghana, we are religious people, whether Islamic, uh, traditional, or um, Christianity. So we need to be very careful and we have to, we, we cannot neglect it and, and then relegate it to the background. We need to try and collaborate with them as well because some of them are giving sand, uh, water, blessed water and so forth. And we still use them. Remember, women pray more when they are pregnant, when they pray more when they are pregnant. So this is something that I think we, so in conclude, concluding, I think that we, we have to start again. It's not too late. We, the professionals, we can relearn. Our students in school, we have to inculcate this in them from the beginning, and that can help them a little more to um, move on. I think we need collaboration with, with the people so that we can now move on. Um, it's a balance. We have to individually bring all of them together. Thank you. These are some of the references that we use, and then these are my people that we did work with. And let me, give, let me take the opportunity to say, I'm so grateful to APEC for always giving the opportunity to talk. Um, Mrs. Oposu Apia, Oposu Apia, yes. My supervisor, James Brown, uh, my family for allowing me to do, uh, uh, a lot of chores in the house and all that. And the most high, thank you very much. And to all of us for observing the longest one minute today. Thank you very much, Dr. Edubon Safo. We are very grateful. So it's not just outcome measures, but process measures. The process measures are not just the procedures, but the human relationship. It goes a long way. We're going to have our last speaker for this session. And we're going to take his presentation uh, by video. So please get ready with a video of Reverend Asamoa Jedu. As they do that, I would like to let you know that Reverend Professor J. Kwabna Asamoa Jedu is the president of the Trinity Theological Seminary, Legon in Accra. He studied at the Trinity Theological Seminary, the University of Ghana, Legon, University of Birmingham, where he obtained a PhD in theology in the year 2000. He's the occupant of the Beta Girl Professorial Chair of Contemporary African Christianity and Pentecostal Theology at the Trinity Theological Seminary. Reverend Professor Asamoah Jedu is the author of several books and many articles on religion and Christianity in Africa. In particular, he has explored the intersections between Pentecostal and charismatic theologies and issues of medical care and reproductive health in Africa. And this afternoon, we are privileged to have him on video to talk to us on what ways can religious leaders be made positive influences towards reducing adverse maternal and perinatal health outcomes related to hypertensive diseases 
in pregnancies. Shall we please have the video? Thank you. Dear colleagues, I am um, sorry that I'm unable to join you in person as uh, originally envisaged, uh, but I'm truly uh, grateful to the organizers of the fourth Preclampsia uh, Scientific Symposium uh, for inviting me uh, to be part of, of the program. I have thoroughly enjoyed my participation um, in the last two uh, seminars that were organized virtually. And um, I'm happy that we are taking the issues of religion and health, particularly in relation to uh, preeclampsia very seriously at the seminary where a lot of uh, Christian leaders and pastors come for formation because my uh, personal view is that giving the very strong relationship between religion and health, um, it will be impossible to deal with issues and problems arising from maternal health uh, in particular without deferring to the contribution of religion and religious leaders. So I'd like to uh, thank you for your understanding that due to circumstances beyond my control, I'm not able to join you. But what I have been asked to speak on briefly um, relates to the influence of religious leaders when it comes to reducing maternal and perinatal health outcomes in relation to hypertensive uh, disorders of pregnancy. Um, so I'd like to make a few remarks um, that relate to that subject matter, that is uh, religious leaders and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. On the face of it, when you talk about hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, it, it, it sounds like dealing with something that belongs exclusively to the field of medicine or medical care. But as most Ghanaians, if not Africans, will admit, when it comes to prenatal issues, pregnancy in particular, religion plays such a critical role in it. And in the past, we have discussed the fact that that role that religion plays in issues relating to uh, pregnancy and the difficulties arising from hypertensive disorders of pregnancy have a lot to do with the vulnerability that people experience when um, they are pregnant. Uh, to support such people or what they can do to support them. So I'm talking about things relating to prayer, to fasting, to healing, to deliverance, to exorcism and so on. Because when these problems arise, the tendency is for the, um, the patients or the clients of medical uh, doctors to think that there is a, a supernatural or spiritual dimension to their problems. In other words, the role of religious leaders in dealing with hypertensive disorders in pregnancy lies in the inseparability uh, between sacred and secular realities in African cultures. We are a people who do not, generally speaking, make a distinction between natural and supernatural, seen and unseen, uh, sacred and secular, because the two intersect very closely. And generally, uh, we look at problems from religious perspectives because of the very critical role that religion plays in, in African cultures and in African life. In the context of the Christian scriptures, for example, health and wholeness, 
emanate from the divine as a sign of blessing. So if you read the Psalms in particular, beginning with Psalm 1, you would find that the person who does not walk in the ways of the wicked and who does not sit in the council of sinners is described as one who is blessed. And in Jewish culture, to which the Psalms belong, blessing would always include health, wholeness, and peace. What in the Hebrew scriptures we would refer to as shalom. And shalom is a word that involves the visitation of the divine or the intervention of the divine and human affairs. So in the context of the Christian scriptures, health and wholeness emanate from the divine as a sign of blessing. And pregnancy and childbirth belong to that category, that category of divine blessing. So when somebody gets pregnant or somebody um, um, gives birth, um, the reception of the child is celebrated in terms of a divine gift. And of course, if uh, pregnancy and childbirth are divine gifts, then when there are problems associated with it, people will naturally defer to divine sources for interventions. Now, what I'm saying does not just um, refer to Christianity. Also in the African traditional context, we are aware that when it comes to pregnancy and childbirth, for example, a lot of, of Ghanaians, a lot of Africans, especially in rural Africa, people would like to um, uh, use um, herbal preparations. And we are all aware from a scientific viewpoint, some of the medical problems that um, these herbal preparations have brought to people. Nevertheless, there are quite a number of people who even believe that herbal preparations are uh, more uh, effectual, more effective than scientific medication. And so it does not matter what counsel you give, people will defer to diviners and herbalists uh, when they are pregnant and when they have, uh, they're experiencing what in the medical sense you will refer to hyper as, as hypertensive disorders and so on. Um, they would interpret it as the attempt by evil persons like witches to interfere in the divine blessing that is coming upon them and their families. And that is why they defer to diviners and herbalists when they have crisis, when they are running temperature rather than, rather than go to the hospital. So in that kind of traditional context, although the use of herbs as medication is widely practiced, certain types of ill health are explained in terms of fractured relationships with ancestors or the result of cases from offended parties. In recent weeks, I have been working on a project, a project that deals with the use of curses within the Ghanaian religious context. And it amazes me that it is not just used by ordinary people, but these days, even pastors weaponize the um, weaponize blessings and curses, depending on how they relate to people. And if you have spent time in any Ghanaian marketplace, you'd find that two of the most popular cases that especially a woman inflicts on other women is that they would have pain in childbirth and they will become infertile. And so when people are pregnant, in a lot of situations, they live in fear. They feel vulnerable, either from competitors in the workplace and especially for women who come from uh, multiple, who are in multiple marriage situations, who are in uh, 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 um, uh, polygamous uh, situations, you would find that they live their lives in fear because they feel vulnerable 
that their pregnancy will be touched by some um, application of supernatural evil, either from a rival or from somebody who doesn't wish them well. Those of you who are familiar with the storylines of the African video films will appreciate the fact that um, some of the things that we see in those films are not fictional. They are uh, real life stories that are translated into film. So generally, etiology and diagnosis in the African context would usually ask the following basic question, who is the cause of my problems? When you have lost a job, when you have lost a, a loved one, especially a child or grandchild, or your business has collapsed, your marriage is not working, people usually like to find out who is manipulating my destiny supernaturally. It's the same kind of worldview that we bring into pregnancy. And as I have noted earlier, when people are pregnant, they are at the most vulnerable period of their lives. And among the accounts of Ghana, among the fact, for example, when a woman gives birth, we describe that woman as having been in battle and having overcome the forces um, that were against her. Um, they would say, Okorisa. Now, I have a fear, jo, jo, jo. literally, she went onto the battlefield and she has come home um, successfully. Of course, the battle we are talking about is not seen in physical terms. It's interpreted in spiritual terms. And if pregnancy is a spiritual issue, then when I have a hypertensive disorder, I look for um, a spiritual solution, a spiritual intervention, rather than a physical one. In other words, if religious leaders want to be influencers in dealing with these kinds of problems, then the first thing to take serious is the worldview within which people operate. If people are operating with a supernatural worldview, then you have to be careful how you interpret their problems through the natural um, source of explanation. Because then there will be a pushback in the sense that they will think that the medical expert does not understand what they are, where they are coming from. So one of the recommendations I'm going to make is for a stronger collaboration between science and health, between science and religion. And in this particular case, between the religious functionary and the medical expert, so that we can attend to patients in a way that makes them feel comfortable. There's a Ghanaian medical sociologist. His name was Kofi Apia Kubi. He wrote a book titled, Man Cures, God Heals. And he studies the healing practices of Ghanaian independent churches based on the fact that for many people, the African prophet, African Christian prophet, or the Islamic cleric is first and foremost a healer. And then that individual has also caught, got the charisma to intervene in human crisis. There is a New Zealander um, who studied new religious movements. His name was Harold W. Turner. And he referred to the African independent churches as prophet healing churches. In other words, these are churches run by prophets and their uh, modus operandi is to offer healing. And here I'm using healing, uh, not just in the sense of uh, a malaria or some kind of uh, uh, illness, but it refers to uh, any situation, including um, pregnancy um, that, that brings along with it health challenges. And so, if a pregnant woman is going through a hypertensive disorder, as I'm trying to explain, sometimes the natural reaction response would be to defer to um, a religious expert rather than a medical expert. And 
prophecy in the Christian context has become an important means of diagnosing ailments and negative things that happen to people. And so if a woman is going through um, a hypertensive disorder, especially within the cultural context that I have described, they would visit a religious functionary to find out why um, I'm running such high temperature or why uh, my pressure um, has gone out of control um, suddenly. Uh, whether the, uh, the, the, the pressure has been taking or not is another matter. There are situations in which people have been giving medical advice by doctors and they have decided that they want to go and consult a pastor or the Islamic cleric or religious leader. In other words, we are accustomed to talking to religious functionaries about our health problems. Traditional healers, diviners, Islamic clerics and Christian faith healers and prophets all play a very critical role, or let me say, play very critical roles in dealing with uh, hypertensive uh, disorders during pregnancy. And so when it comes to ill health, it has become virtually impossible to deal with ailments without reference to religion. And I think this is where the matter of influence comes in. Healing camps, for example, are a very popular destination for the sick, precisely because of the mystical approach to ill health and misfortune. And when people take a mystical approach to ill health, once they are pregnant and they are having these hypertensive disorders, families, friends, loved ones make recommendations. And the place you find them is the healing camp. I'm going to make a recommendation that will suggest that if we cannot get them to at least consult a medical expert, let's take the medical consultancy to the healing camp. After all, that is where they are quarantined. So one of the recommendations I'm going to make is for the um, healthcare professionals to liaise with the um, um, directors of these healing camps, the pastors and prophets, so that the medical consultancy can be set up right at the healing camp. And when it has the, the endorsement of the prophet or diviner or whoever, the likelihood that people will patronize the services will be very high. Ghana's healing camps are some of the places to find women experiencing hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. In the world views of both patients and clients, the relationship between pregnancy and the force of evil is quite strong. And pregnancy is spoken of in terms of a woman's glory or a man's glory, the glory of marriage, which means those in that condition often feel vulnerable in the face of beliefs that some of their community uh, may wish them evil. And so they will seek prayerful intervention. But how do you educate those from whom they seek these prayerful interventions to encourage them to combine the religious with the secular or religious with the scientific? Yeah. Reverend has a lot to share with us. Because he's not here, we couldn't give him the five minutes and things that we were showing people. But for the sake of time, we need to move on. I believe the message has gone down. And when we are done with everything, we'll continue to play the clip so that we, continue, we can hear the rest of his message. But thank you very much, Reverend Professor Samuel Jedu for sharing these insights with us. We're going to have a short Q&A session. And then after that, we'll have our panel discussion. So please, as we have the Q&A, please come and arrange the chairs on stage for us. We need five chairs on stage, but we'll take a few questions. 
Please, I need somebody. Nana Pachabra. Nana, please help us with the mic. We have talked about how policy, research, and religion can collaborate to help us deal with hypertensive diseases in pregnancy, given by Dr. Fofi, Dr. Edubon Safo, and Reverend Professor Asamwajidu. Do you have any points of discussions, any questions, any experiences in these areas to share with us? The mic will go around. Please raise your hand if you have any question or comment. Thank you. Questions, comments, there's a hand there. He's there. Any other hand so that we come to you? Okay, I'm very happy to see a student's hand. So Nana, from there, you can please speak as, be ready. Reverend Professor Jedu is not here, but when questions are asked and you or comments and you have any comments on that, you can raise your hand, I will let you share it. So we take you, then we take the student and we will take him. That will be it for this round. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you very much. Uh, the presentations were very insightful. Uh, my question will go to the second speaker. I think in his presentation, he really talked about some of the mistreatment as defined by health workers, which um, make women not to come to the facility the second time. Um, maybe we can mother to say that maybe attitudes of health workers. And in his presentation, he made some suggestions as to what health workers could avoid in order to encourage women to come to the facility. But I also like to ask, what will be his suggestions or suggestions of other uh, professionals here of what the facilities could do so that the interventions or the actions are not left in the hands of individual health workers only, but then at the facility, the facility level, what are some of the Of issues. I'd like to know, are there experiences that professionals, at least in this region, could share with us as to how we are connecting with the spiritual camps to improve women's health? Thank you. My name is Joanita. Please, I want to ask the preeclampsia issue has there been any case that a woman with three pregnancies not consecutively lose her baby or in any case one survives? Please, I wanted to ask that, has there been any case that a woman with three pregnancies lose all her babies or in any case the third pregnancy the baby survives okay thank you i think i'll take the last question um my first thing is that all the two speakers spoke about collaboration collaboration i think it's been long overdue since our pastor start, started stamping on our pregnant mothers was pregnant for at times five months, six months, you see faster stepping on their stomach, stepping on their stomach. This video has been there for long, 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 but still uh, the collaboration is still going on. Please, I want to know the spiritualists and the pastors and our medical practitioners, or let's say Ghana Health Service, what is missing 
What is the missing gap? That the spiritualists and the pastors have a very good customer relation than our professionals, our health professionals. That's who that they have learned a lot and don't have that kind of customer relation that will deal with the pregnant woman to come out or to give the adequate information that they will need in order to make an informed decision. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I think with what I wanted to talk about, Professor um, Asama Jodu spoke a little about it because previously when we were talking about the various things to look at, I was asking if we've considered the issue of traditional medicine because in our parts of the world, when people have, when there is this illness in health, um, there is the rush to just resort to traditional or herbal medicine, especially when there is the issue of high cost. So in order to avoid cost or to avoid the cost that they are not able to afford in terms of management, they just resort to traditional medicine. So I, just, I just wanted to know that as we are looking at the various aspects, the psychological aspects, the pollution and others, have we considered since it is being, this study is being made contextual in the case of Ghana, have we considered this since it is something very known to us? Thank you. Professor Sam will answer the question on religion. Then we will take the response from the other speakers. And on your question, we have a live experience then she also share with us. So Prof, thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted to answer the question on the, the question that was raised about um, how do we um, take or engage the spiritualists and are there any such experiences? There's an experience from the Upper East region and that was to do with severe malaria where because people convulse, you know, it's similar to this in spectrum because the children convulse once they, they have fever and they convulse, the first place to take the child is the spiritualist and the traditional healer because it is taught that it's also a spiritual thing. And so what they did was to have a discussion with the traditional healers in the area and to discuss with them that we really appreciate the role you, you play. And what you are doing is very important. We don't discount it. But once you finish your things, could you refer the child to the hospital so that we will also do our part? So you do yours very quickly and then let the woman come to us and we will do our part. And that worked very well because then there was this collaboration. They were in constant touch with the spiritual healers. They will quickly do their things, whatever they wanted to do, and then send the mother and the child to the hospital so that they will deal with it. They, they, they will treat the severe malaria case. So this is an example of, of that. Thank you very much. It is, but what, 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 two things. You either don't get the child at all, and the child dies with the traditional healer, or you, you get the child, but very quickly. So basically, they were not saying, let the people come to you first. If they happen to come to you, could you send them on to us? So it is two things. It may cause a delay, but there are two things. Either you've delayed or you don't get the child at all. The child dies with a traditional healer because they need an anti-malaria. Yeah, I just want to add on to what uh, Prof. Ansan just said. I read an article where uh, somebody had eclampsia and she was taken to uh, a prayer camp. And because uh, the person was convulsing, you know, they thought it was uh, maybe witchcraft or spirits in that person. So they started praying throughout the night, nothing, nothing worked. So uh, somebody advised that they send the lady to the hospital. And then when they went, you know, the healthcare personnel gathered together and then uh, 
they, they apply magnesium sulfate and other things, you know, and then uh, the woman was okay. And then later on, they asked, so what did you do? Because we prayed throughout the night, nothing happened. So, and through that, they came together and then they started having education with those people. And now they, they have formed a women's group, you know, to educate them. So uh, we can still work with the special uh, uh, spiritualists and it will work. So we can, the education will, will go, if the education goes down well with them, I think we will be able to achieve something. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I know the experience from Tema where they identify the pastors, the religious leaders of their clients, you know, over a period of time, they asked them to give them their contacts and they invited them to a symposium and they spoke to them, they taught them. So there are many ways we can engage these people. Dr. Srofenyo, please. Let you finish and then we can take that. Thank you. Um... There was an interesting question by one of the students. Is it, has there been a case where somebody maybe have lost the first pregnancy, second pregnancy, and then now gets the third pregnancy? So that, I see that as a very interesting question because by the risk factor profiling of preeclampsia, it's to be commoner, first pregnancy, second pregnancies. And the rate is supposed to have reduced. That is the normal pattern. But with situations where, so normally we say that the risk is high with your first or second pregnancies. However, we do have situations where somebody can be a high risk person from the very first pregnancy and this can progress throughout the subsequent pregnancy. The CEO of APEC Ghana, for example, would like to share her own experience when it comes to this. Even at the very last pregnancy, she still developed the severe kind of disease. Thank you very much, CEO. Please come and tell us. Answer the student's questions for him. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Koiwa Koila Beautiful Sophia. Um, just as doctor said, I'm a four-time survivor of um, hypertensive disorder in pregnancy. As he indicated, that our first, normally the risk is high with the first one. Well, with my first one, I had full-blown eclampsia. And in full-blown eclampsia, you go into seizures, like how eclamptic, you know, those who have epilepsy, they fit. And then I was rushed in emergency seizures. The second one I did have, preeclampsia, and I think that one was quite minimal, but um, I was managed up to 37 weeks and I had a living child. My first baby died. But then with the subsequent pregnancy, which was 2017, clearly you would have expected that the risk would have reduced, but it hadn't. So I got pregnant again, this time the same uh, 27 weeks, but I had severe preeclampsia. And that's what you saw in the documentary. For that one, the baby died in my womb. And the most recent experience, when we thought, when I thought I knew all the knowledge, when I thought I had all the research support, was just in 2020 April. I had severe preeclampsia with what? Help syndrome. So in my case, it's been risk factor going high, west, west, west. And unfortunately, even though there was hope, baby Grace, as I called her, also passed after three days. So that's two years on and life has moved on. So as doctor was saying, it's, I guess it's different. Yes, there's the standard that the risk is supposed to reduce with almost every pregnancy, but there are exceptional cases like us. And maybe that's why we are here to do the work that we do. Thank you. All right, so um, in terms of the respectful care and the collaboration with the other, um, the spiritualists and the traditionalists, this is very important. I think 
what we do is that sometimes we think what they do, they don't know what they do. We kind of, there, there seems to be some conflict between the medical people and then the, uh, the spiritualists or the pastors and then the traditionalists. And I think it's about time that we look at it as if we are all aiming at the same thing. And we have to talk Well, the pastor actually recommended that if we can set up the hospitals in the, uh, in the, in the, in the churches. I think in future, maybe that may be a point to go where you can get them because as Prof said, in her case, they had malaria convulsing the spiritualist CFS and they refer early. Sometimes they might delay, they think it's spiritual and they want to pray and do something about it. So it's about time that we stop criticizing them so much and then bring them on board and then we can all work together to make sure we achieve a common goal. So we all have to try and not criticize them so much. Even if they make a mistake, there's a better way to say it so that they can understand. And then we learn from it. Because whatever we do, most of our women and children will still go there. Thank you. Prof, want to say something? Thank you, Prof. Before they send the child, they had given them rectal test on it, the spiritualist. Oh. So they gave it to them. You put this in the child's uh, buttocks. Put it, insert it, and then send them. So do your things, but insert this drug that we are giving. You know, right, rectal testing it will rapidly bring the parasites down. And since putting things in the inner is one of the things traditional healers are comfortable with, they would insert it very quickly, do their things, and by the time the child gets to the hospital, the parasites have gone down. So that was an important information I forgot. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, one, regarding the recurrent of the preeclampsia, uh, the theory is that if you have a preeclampsia in the early pregnancy, before 28 weeks, you have 50% chance of recurrent. If you have it around near the term, like 34 weeks going, then the chance of recurrent is 25%. So that's the risk, depending on where you have it whether it will occur in the next pregnancy. Uh, regarding the respectful pregnancy care, uh, it's a spectrum. I will talk in terms of we the lecturers. Uh, because of uh, the nature of the trend of the diseases in the, our, our environment in pregnancy. Now, when we are setting up exam, or when we teach and we are setting up exam, for example, now we have what you call, I mean, OSCU, practical exam. So for the, formally, for the practical exam, we don't have a vaginal examination as part of the practical exam. Because for the traditional one, you can't go and put a woman there that you are doing any vaginal examination. But knowing that, because of that, doctors don't know how to approach examination of a woman vaginally. So these are being incorporated in their assessment now, which you call OSQ. So we have training for them, how they will approach a woman in a respectful way before examining the woman. And we examine them in the examination as well. So we use a model for them to go and approach. And if you look at our marking scheme now, the marking scheme is that, that respect, how you grow, how you approach the woman, the greeting, how you, I mean, secure the privacy and confidentiality, take higher mark before even your examination of the woman itself. Because we are always trying to be abreast with what is occurring in our environment. So I think with time, the rotten who will be coming out are likely to be better than we. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I think, as we predicted, it's getting more and more interesting, but we also are conscious of the time and we want to try and finish within our scheduled time. Um, when we finish the next session and the chairman uh, gives his closing remarks, uh, we have some, I think some packs for people to take because uh, we had a snack earlier on, I, am I right? 
Yeah, so at least that's something to um, compensate you for, for um, your time with us. We are now going into the final session of our conference today. Remember, this is the fourth APEC conference. Now to have four conferences is a big deal. It means success. So congratulations to APEC and all the supporters of APEC. Um, I happen to be a foundation member of the African Nutrition Society, and we've had our 10th uh, conference, and it's biennial, so it's been over 20 years. That is success. Um, we will have a roundtable discussion, and here we are going to invite some of the earlier speakers, experts, uh, to come up stage, and uh, I would like to, at this time, invite his lordship, uh, Justice George Bwedi to join us, please, on stage. Thank you very much. And I think Justice, his lordship has been introduced earlier. He's a supervising high court judge for the Volta and OT regions. We would also like to invite Dr. Emmanuel Sofanyo, uh, the director of the Greater Accra Regional Hospital, to join us on stage. And uh, we would like uh, Dr. Chris Fofier to come back um, and join us. He's the director uh, of the. Uh, the safe motherhood, um, you know, uh, unit of the family health division of the Ghana Health Service. And last but not the least, we want to invite uh, another person who has not been introduced yet. And that is why I left her introduction to the last. Professor Ernestina Donko is a professor of nursing and midwifery at the University of Health and Allied Sciences and the Dean of the School of Nursing and Midwifery. Prior to her appointment here, Professor Donko was the Dean of the School of Nursing and Midwifery at the University of Ghana. She is a, a nurse and midwife by training, having obtained her BSc in nursing and psychology at the University of Ghana. And after some professional uh, stints, she went on to do a master's degree in advanced midwifery at the University of Ulster, which is in Northern Ireland in the United Kingdom. And then she obtained her PhD in nursing studies at King's College London. Uh, and that's part of London University. She's had many years of working uh, both uh, in clinical practice and in teaching and research. And her research interests include uh, the midwifery uh, women's health with a focus on female infertility. Uh, her inputs include peer reviewed publications, uh, book chapters, and a book. So, uh, Professor, it is nice to have you on board. And we're going to have a wonderful discussion. It's going to be very brief, and we would like you to participate. Um, at some point, I'll ask the audience to ask questions. We are going to be looking at two areas. One is uh, about intersectoral collaboration. And as somebody said earlier on, we've been talking about collaboration, collaboration, what exactly do we mean? And the question is, an intersectoral collaboration between research, policy, and religion can bridge knowledge gaps towards improving outcomes of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy in Ghana. And that is the issue that we would like our panelists to, uh, to give us their perspectives on and then maybe we'll take one or two perspectives or questions from the audience, and then we'll move on to the second part, which will be to look at 
the issue of religion and healthcare, uh, which Professor Asamoa Jedu has very so eloquently uh, talked about. And then, of course, before him, uh, Dr. Edu uh, Bonsafo had also talked about it. So without much ado, I'll join the panel and uh, we'll start. I would like to start with the issue of um, intersectoral collaboration between research, policy, and religion, uh, and uh, whether this can bridge knowledge gaps towards improving outcomes of hepatitis disorders, pregnancy. And Dr. Chris Wolfie, if you can look at the uh, the policy side of things. You are from the Ghana Health Service, from the Family Health Division. Uh, I know you've been involved in for, uh, policy formulation and, and things like that. And now we're talking about how we can actually uh, develop some collaborations between research, policy, and religion. Uh, what are your perspectives? Yes, thank you very much for the opportunity. And I will say, Really, that is an area we're looking deep into seeing how to bring all these pieces together. And how do we intend doing that? First, the initial strategy is to see how to link health care with research. And that is because we strongly believe that healthcare on its own cannot bring the needed development that we require unless it is linked with research. So we review our performance, we review intervention and strategies using research methodologies and get the best of all the evidence needed to be able to feed into interventions that we do. Then after we link that, the next area is to link um, religion into it, how to fuse the, the psychosocial aspect of it. And that aspect too, we found a commonality, which we, I explained to some extent in our, our presentation earlier on. So first is to see how we can get hospitals or healthcare facilities to be able to take deep consideration into the, the spiritual needs of our client. So any idea that will permit us to be able to put as a chaplain, church, mosque within the confines of our health facilities, so that at least we send a signal straight away that we are not against religion. We respect individual views and beliefs systems. However, we will want that there should be clear guidelines that will permit that uh, there won't be abuses because that is also part of our responsibility. We are duty bearers and we have a responsibility to make sure that the rights of people are respected and are, are, are pulled to the highest level. So that bit of it is where we have a little bit of a challenge now because in that space, there are quite a lot of gaps where we don't really have regulation. So, uh, people are able to operate freely. So we intend to forward this to the Ministry of Health who will be at the helm of it and guide us to be able to put a little bit of structures so that we can regulate and get um, policies in place that will limit certain type of behaviors and then permit all of us to be able to operate freely within that space to provide uh, health care devoid of abuses and all that sort of thing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, I'll, I'll, it's interesting what you mentioned, especially in relation to uh, getting the religious groups involved at a health facility level. I'm sure we've all seen when we've gone to hospital, sometimes you have people preaching, you know, whilst patients are waiting at the outpatients department. I have certainly witnessed this at Kolebu, uh, where you have people in the morning, the patients are waiting to be seen and they are there and they are preaching and they're questioning. And we also have chaplaincy boards in some of the hospitals. Uh, and, and, and perhaps we'll hear a little bit about that. Uh, but the question is, to what extent are we collaborating with these groups so that they can actually be part of the education, education, education that his lordship talked about. So I'd like his lordship to comment a little bit about this, because in your talk this morning, you touched on the issue of religion. 
And as we have heard this afternoon from Professor uh, Asamoa Jedu, the interrelationship between religion and health are such that you know, um, we cannot easily separate them, not only in our African context, but if you look historically, religion and health have always gone hand in hand, even though sometimes uh, we see things being done that we don't necessarily agree with. And uh, what's your perspective in terms of how we can actually bridge this gap between the religious um, you know, entities and then the health uh, you know, uh, and then also with your experience as a previous lawmaker, uh, in terms of how we can bring this into policy and, and practice. Okay, uh, I would start by going back. <clears throat> I think I, we initiated discussion with the, the Professor Odami, Dr. Odami, you are your Odami? Yes. You? Coffee, and then whilst we're having our snack. And the problem that we have in this country is that we are slow in responding to issues. When you take parliament, where I, I started, you know, perhaps because of our constitutional framework, it's only the executive who have to initiate legislation. You could see something happening, something going wrong, but until the executive respond, you know, and they take time to respond. Why? Because every legislation involves budgeting or finance. And so normally they, they, they are very slow on, on that. It's only recently that we had this uh, private members bill being sponsored by some MPs on this uh, LGBT. You see, so the discussion that we're having is that I was asking them, has and for my background, as a former lawmaker and as a, a lawyer, and a, my training is human rights. We do international constitutional comparison and all those things. You know, I was asking the policymakers, have they really appreciated the extent of fatalities and casualties involved in this HDP, that is a hypertensive disorder of pregnancies? The answer is yes. And so if the answer is yes, what has been the state's response? You know, if the answer is yes, the state has recognized that all these things are happening, there need to be a response, you see? And the response, because most, and that's the reason why I cited the, the treatment action, action case in South Africa. I was there when that case is being tried at the Constitutional Court. You know, every, we live in a country, everything that you initiate is look at partisan lines, you know? Because this is the case, the state response will always be that there's no money. And, and indeed, when I, we had that chat, there was a response that it involves money. It involves money. It involves money. And so for my background, I mean, I, I come from a background where we, we push people to work. You know, I'm so I'm not a popular guy. I will make you work. You know, I will make you, excite you, coerce you to think. Particularly so when you are a, 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 what do you call it, a duty bearer. The law enjoins you to look at my welfare. The law enjoins you having campaign that you have the brains, you have everything to make sure that when I sleep, I sleep. When my whatever is going wrong, that, that's where. Then therefore, you need to protect me. You need to protect women. You need to protect children. And then I think somebody, one of the professors said, why should a woman die because of pregnancy at this stage? In this contemporary world, knowledge is so abound. But they will always tell you there's no money. They will always tell you there's no money. So me, that's the area where I do most. And I'll push you and I will look into areas where it's almost everywhere comparatively that you have signed the UN declarations on human rights. You have signed the international covenant, covenant on this and this and that. You have signed the uh, Cairo uh, Declaration on Human Rights. You have signed this, all this, and then you come home and you are telling that there's no money and so you can. Then what did you sign? You see, so I really deal with policymakers and I, I had a, I didn't allow them to be <laughs> enjoying their snack. I was asking them those questions. So in terms of introduction, that is it. I am not so much good in this religion type of thing, but. Because when I come in, I come in to make sure that people respect the law. 
But really, I don't understand why you, you don't know anything about medicine. You don't know even the religion that you think that way is complementary to health. You know, you don't know. All that you are doing is just matramakwe. Oh, when it doesn't happen this way, it will happen this way. And so people believe it. And we allow such people to be operating. You see, so when I come in, I will come with, I, I like a situation where there's orderliness. There's discipline. Everybody knows what you have to do. But, but we are human beings. We are not angels. Unless somebody comes in, then you can do it this way. You can do it this way. You can do it this way. And then and that, everybody does whatever, whatever he likes. And that's what is happening in this country. So when you ask me, or if you ask me, I will say that I will really be on the next of the policymakers. I will be on the next on the policymakers. They should do something. As long as they have identified that, the fatalities involved in hypertensive, this, uh, uh, what do you call it, in uh, pregnancy, they need to do something. They, by, by this time, there should have been some regional survey about what is happening in the voter region, what's happening in the, in the northern region, or what are the likely causes? Is it because of the diets? Is it because of this? Is it because of the smoke environment? Is it because of perhaps maybe the Voltarians are not all that succumbing to all this because of the beautiful air, the environment, other than those here, though, we, that is why we need to get so that the executive, when they get this, they will push it into law so that there will be some orderliness. So that's the way me and I look at it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, and I like your passion as well. I think you've made a few points there uh, in terms of the legislative processes and how long it takes. And the fact that um, apart from private members' bills, Usually it is a president who has to submit, which means that advocacy is very important. And I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll get to that at some point. But before we come to uh, uh, Professor uh, Donko, I would like uh, Dr. Sofrano to just um, from your own experience, now you are the director of the Greater Accra Regional Hospital. Are there any initiatives that you have embarked upon uh, from your side with the, the freedom to act that you have, uh, the powers that you have as the director in terms of how you bring these various groups together and to collaborate uh, with, with them, particularly looking at uh, not only policy issues, but also guidelines, their implementation, and then the role of the religious uh, groups. Now, in doing this, I think Earlier on, uh, Dr. Edu uh, uh, Bonsafo talked about this issue about respect and the way that patients are treated and how that then makes them to feel like going to these alternative places. What's the experience in your, in your hospital and how have you tried to address some of those issues? Thank you very much. Um, I will start from this point by saying that we have the situation that we have on hand because of the gap, as far as from the patient point of view, because of the gap between medicine on one hand and then religion on the other hand. And each of these professionals think that they know it all. So the doctors also feel, or let's say the medical fraternity also feel that they know it all. And the religious people also feel that they know it all. If we can have a situation where we can bridge this gap, and one of the ways to bridge this gap is what Dr. Fufi spoke about, of, of having chaplaincy systems in the, within the hospitals. And the pastor suggested that we should bring the medical practice into the religious houses. One of the ways that we can also bridge this gap is for the doctors to realize that the individual who is the patient that they are managing are religious in nature. And therefore, any kind of treatment you propose to them, that religious factor, you have to bear that in mind, that the kind of person you are dealing with or the patient that you are dealing with is not just a physical person, but is somebody who is being well-grounded into religious matters, because that is how we have been brought up. And so, you must not lose sight of that when you are treating such a person. Bringing in the God factor always along the line. You have applied your Western medical systems by reassuring him or her 
that God is in control. That way, it's not likely because on my own word, I've had a situation where a woman who has severe preeclampsia, uh, he was told, she was told that the, doc the doctor on rounds said, oh, the blood pressure has gone up, the parameters are not looking good. And so she was told that we are going to terminate the pregnancy. So when the doctor said that and spoke the big English and left, the patient packed her things at the back of everybody and left that she was going to the uh, spiritual home for prayers. Because the doctor did not take his time to give in-depth explanation and also assure her that in all this, God will be in charge so that whatever outcome we get will be in your best interest. The doctor didn't do that. The doctor was so grounded in his medical knowledge. And so that is what I see, I see as a major gap. You spoke about respectful maternal care. Somebody asked, what can we do to bridge the gap or to make sure that this does not continue to go on and on and on? You wanted me to comment on that also. I think that there are several ways we can approach this. One is that we, we have to assume that the nurses or the clinical staff, the doctors, maybe have not been adequately trained as to how to respect these mothers. Uh, the lecturer said that now it's part of the examination. You'll be, you'll be examined on how to treat a woman in a very gentle manner. So I see it right away that it's lack of adequate training, how to handle pregnant women. It is a completely different art. And so when you have not been trained adequately in medical school or in a nursing uh, in midwifery schools, you cannot all of a sudden know it all. So training is one of the ways that we can bridge this gap. And another way we can bridge the gap uh, is feedback systems. The person may not know, the staff may not know. They have practiced it this way over the years. They may not know that what they are doing is wrong. So if somebody observes and bring feedback to them, that look, for example, Dr. Bonsafo, one of the things they did was to let a researcher stand by to see. So if at the end of the day, feedbacks are brought to them and they appreciate the fact that, look, what we are doing is not the best way to go, I believe that they will change. So these are the two systems. For example, in my hospital, we have a feedback system and then we also have opportunity for patients to call a line. We establish a, a call line that if you come and you've been treated in a way that you don't like, please call this number. The customer service team will take the information and then they will give the necessary feedback to the staff involved and the feedback will also be given to the medical director who will take certain actions, go into the case and take certain additional actions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and talking, talking about uh, uh, feedback, I think um, in his uh, talk, Dr. Edu Bonsafo also talked about some patient satisfaction survey that was carried out as part of the studies that they've, they've been doing. And perhaps that is something that you might wish to look at because these feedback boxes that we usually have in the hospitals, people put things in there, but the question is whether we are able to get a broader view in terms of the cross-section of the patients visiting the facility so that we can do something about it. In my own experience recently, I was a patient in ICU at Kolebu. And when I was there, I, I observed something. The, the people working in ICU were excellent. Their training, the nurses, they were excellent at the job that they did. However, I noticed something. There were a few of the nurses who did not take their work very seriously. Their attitude towards patients was bad. Even when you call them, they will take their time to respond to you and things like that. And there was a little girl who was in the ICU with me. She couldn't sleep because of the noise that some of the nurses made when they were on duty. And the machines themselves are making enough noise. And then on top of that, you have nurses who come in at night and they will make noise throughout the night. I was lying there and they thought that I was asleep because I had had surgery and I was just lying there. 
In the morning, when the director of nursing came, I told her, I said, Madam Director, you do a great job here. But let me tell you something. What the patient leaves here with is the experience they have outside of your clinical, the work that you do. And what I have observed here, you need to do something about it. So they had to take immediate actions. And I, I told them about those who had been involved to do something like that. So Professor Donko, you have been in nursing and midwifery for many years. You've been a practitioner, you've been a trainer, and now you are the Dean of the School of Nursing and Midwifery. From the, what we are sharing now, how do you think that as a school, you can contribute to this question of the proper training, ensuring that professionalism is, is, is practiced at all times, and that all the different components, nurses, midwives, and the doctors can contribute together collaboratively with other stakeholders in order to improve the patient experience and to you know, tackle issues around pregnancy uh, uh, related hypertension. Thank you very much. Um, as you said, we are training nurses and midwives. Um, I read a few articles and what I realized, what, what I, what the findings were that uh, there was a knowledge gap in terms of uh, hypertensive, uh, hypertensive disorders. disorders of pregnancy. So the midwives, the nurses on the ward, they don't have adequate knowledge. And uh, the patients also, they also don't have adequate knowledge. So if we, they don't understand the condition that they are having, it will be very difficult for them to cope with whatever they are taught. So uh, I would say that nurses and midwives, those who, are, who have already graduated, they need to upgrade themselves because there's a knowledge gap. You know, that's what the, some of the articles are saying. And, and the, the thing is, if the midwives do not have adequate knowledge, how are they going to impart it on the patients? Which means the patients also is not going to have the knowledge that they need also to help uh, uh, cope with whatever they have. So I think in, a, in the school, we also need to uh, intensify or strategize as to how we teach our students so that when they go out there, they will be able to perform. Um, the community too, I also read an article on the community, about the community. We realize that the community's perspectives are different, which means there's a knowledge gap also in the community. So everywhere there's a knowledge gap. And as Reverend said, we need the education. Everybody needs education. So we need to package you know, uh, the messages that we give to our clients. For example, in, at antenatal, when a, a health education is going to be given, we need to package the mes message in such a way that uh, we'll bring it to the understanding of the clients because uh, those who are educated are able to understand better understand what is being taught as compared to those who are illiterate. So we need to package the messages well so that they will be able to get what we are trying to teach them. Other than that, you know, we are not going to get anywhere. So I think the education is very, very important. We need to know what the whole thing is about because like uh, the patients, they need to know the symptoms. They need to know the, uh, uh, what, what is it, uh, the, the, the signs, the danger signs. Because if you, so for example, somebody is having edema, she's having high BP, and other thing, the weight, the weight is increasing. So if you are a midwife and you check the weight and you realize that it has gone up drastically, what is the implications? So whatever readings that we are taking, we, we should understand them so that we can read meanings to it and then advice appropriately. 
So I think the education, we have to uh, do it well. And the students also must read around whatever they are taught so that they will be able to put them into practice. Thank you very much. So it is clear to, to me that from what you are all saying that there's a lot of room for improvement as far as education is concerned across all across the board, both in terms of people who are in practice and people who are in training. And I think that there's something called interprofessional uh, 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 practice where we can bring nurses, doctors, and other health workers together along with other stakeholders, you know, in occasional workshops and seminars and things like that. There's also the need to improve customer care training for our students. And I think the medical, uh, the School of Medicine have already told us about what they examine. But the question is before the examination, during the training, how much input is there in terms of making the students aware of all these things and then working through that? Uh, there is so much that we could talk about, uh, so much more we could talk about, but because of the time constraints we have, I just wonder if there are any one or two quick comments or you know anything that anyone wants to see say before we we get the takes of, of uh, our panelists and then we would have finished yes there is uh, uh, a hand up there and then uh, uh, can we get the mic here yeah. okay all right uh, gentleman at the back there and then and then uh, prof uh, prof Ansa, and then uh, the lady in the middle. Okay, we just take those three. Oh, <laughs> okay, let's see how it goes. Okay, we have just about eight minutes left. Go ahead, please. You know, thank you very much. My name is Robert Amenu. Uh, I also agree that uh, in terms of religion and then medical practice, we cannot separate them. And we need to find a way to always collaborate. But my challenge is before even the orthodox medicine or treatment came, some of the signs and symptoms that uh, we present in the local languages, in quote, are attached to spiritual understanding. For example, uh, in the Volta region or the Everland, if somebody is convulsing, we use the word which is already attached to something spiritual that is happening to the person. And in practice, I have a challenge that sometimes the professional, this one is cut across the doctors, the nurses, and other professional. They have the idea, they have the knowledge, but how to actually explain this thing to the understanding of the people in the local language is a problem. Sometimes we try to say it in the English, we use the jargon, but the people, they don't understand. What can we do to look at this area in a way, I don't know much about other regions, that we can explain some of these basic things to our people. Before the scan, a or scan machine, a woman is pregnant, having edema, and the belief is that probably she's going to give birth to twins. So they are rejoicing because the woman is having edema, and they are, giving, they are going to give birth to twins that woman will not go to the hospital. What can we do to explain some of these things in a language that the people can understand? And what can we do during the training that the professional that are coming will be able to explain some of these things in a way that the patient will understand? Thank you. Thank you. Professor. Thank you very much. I want to um, take a different angle talking to the Ghana Health Service, Ministry of Health. You know, there are many things that are coming up, new things every day. And a new management um, uh, protocols, etc. What I find is that Ghana Health Service and Ministry of Health focuses on training people who have left training and are in service they totally forget about the trainers of the, of the students that will be coming up, out. 
So the trainers who are in the university, the trainers who are in the tra nursing training institutions, the medical schools who are training the people are totally forgotten about. So they are not brought abreast with the changes. Basically, there's waiting at the end of the river for the people to come out and then they are dealt with. Why not go to the beginning of the river and deal with the source? Then by the time the people come out, they are totally abreast with what is being done. So some of the things, uh, the management protocols that are coming up for these hypertensive disorders in pregnancy, I think one of the ways is to target the training institution, get them in there, and they will pass it on to the students. By the time they come out, they are fine. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. I think uh, this, this has implications for uh, modifications to our curricula so that the training is more fit for purpose, as it were. And then the people come out and they are ready to serve their community. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you for your discussion. My, my, my concern is a suggestion. Uh, I want to say, don't you think that public education towards a uh, career counseling, you know, nowadays our, uh, parents are giving pressure to their kids in entering the health institutions, you know, the readily available jobs and stuff. So when we were discussing attitude, attitude and stuff, some of them, they go and do the chew and pour. They post them to their various facilities. Some hide behind others to work when they leave their problems. So I think that even though we are talking about pre and but there are other health conditions that are there. So I think if we do more education on public sensitization on career counseling, it will also help. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think this is another very important point. And the point that was made about uh, what we are actually disseminating, the level to which we are educating the public. First, we must have the facts. And then we must be able to translate that in a way that people will understand. But you are saying that not everybody who goes for the training is necessarily committed to the training and the sacrifices that come with being a health professional. And so all those need to be you know, embedded within the way we train people so that they can, before they cross the river, they already know what to expect, how difficult it is for them to cross that river. And when they get to the other side, they'll be better prepared to, um, to, to provide the service. I would like us to finish by uh, taking the take-home messages. Oh, somebody wants to, okay, all right. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, please, my concern is about the policy of most of our health centers. Like, most often when someone is in pain, they'll be like, the person is supposed to pay this amount of money. And if the person doesn't pay the amount of money, he or she is not taken care of. I like to put it to the people that on that day, there were two killers, the disease and then the health personnel who killed the patient. Okay, thank, thank, thank you very much. It, 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 I, I, think you have, I think you have just made a point about customer care. Okay, when I was in school many years ago, before you were born, uh, we, there was a book that we read, Who Killed Lucy? Is it the disease or the healthcare workers? So that's a very, on that note, I would like our panelists to give us very briefly, each person to give us a take home message because we have had a lot today. And I know the chairman is going to give his closing remarks. We've had so much today. There's been so much about education. There's been so much about collaboration, about training, customer care, patient satisfaction, uh, religious groups and how we get them involved. Uh, Professor Donko, can you please give us your, your, your final impressions and your take home message? One thing that you like all of us to take away with us from here. Thank you. Thank you very much. What I would say is that uh, hypertensive disorders of uh, pregnancy is a very serious condition that at the hospital, 
it, it's an emergency situation that we have to attend to. So, we, and we know how it comes about. Uh, it's due to high blood pressure. You know, some women are already hypertensive before they became pregnant. So, uh, the, the, so before they, so uh, the, uh, the preeclampsia also can superimpose the chronic uh, condition that they had. And people, other, other women too, they get the condition because of uh, the pregnancy, because due gestational pregnancy, gestational uh, disorders. So they also, because of that, uh, they get increased, uh, their blood pressures go up. So all of them, all this, the one thing that we know is that we should be able to identify early and make the appropriate diagnosis of uh, women uh, who have high BPs. So the women at high risk, we should be able to identify them early, manage them, and then where we need to do uh, have a delivery, we can, we can do that. So we should attach some importance to this, and then we have to take it seriously because it's through this that they can get a uh, eclampsia. And you know, the eclampsia also brings in fits. And once that sets in, it means the prognosis is going to be poor for both the mother and then the baby. Yeah. So, and then another thing, I want to touch on the health uh, system. There should be strengthening in the health system because at the end of the day, we have to send the patient there. And then when we, the patient gets there, how ready, how ready are they to receive the client to uh, help her out? So, and sometimes even uh, the staff on duty, the well-trained staff on duty, they are not there. And such conditions where we, you have two on the ward and you are alone, it will be very difficult to manage them. So we have to look at all these things and then make sure that we put things in order. Other than that, we we'll work and wouldn't get anywhere because the principles that we use to uh, manage this uh, condition is the same everywhere. Mm. But how come the developed countries, they are able to uh, have fewer mortalities, but the uh, resource uh, constraint uh, settings, they have high mortality. So we have to look at that. We are all dealing at, uh, with the same problem, but they are able to manage it well. But we don't because we don't have what it takes to manage it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Dr. Fofie, your take home message. Thank and, you very uh, much. Let's it, keep it very brief. Good. If you yeah. permit me, I want to address one issue I think could, could help in, in clearing things. First, to respond to the young man about his question, not direct answer, but also to give us information that will serve to most of us that Ghana has specific laws and we're saying that universal health coverage, that is all people in Ghana should have access to quality education, independent quality health care independent of the cost. And based on our health insurance policy, anywhere in the country you go, nobody can request for money before you are provided service, at least for the first 24 hours. So if anybody does that, it's violating your fundamental human right and it's against the rule. So if you know that and you, you, you have the capacity to challenge, so across board, I'm just saying it so that young people will have that and be able to challenge any healthcare provider that does that. The second comment quickly is, um, we have uh, trainers in training institutions and we think that there is a bit of a disconnect. In my personal view, I think that the trainers themselves should be part of the learning process and the practice. Because if you have the best pilot in, let's say, Obwasi Dentra, teaching how to fly without a plane, how do you think he will be able to do that very well? In other words, what I'm suggesting is that if you are a, a doctor teaching how to do surgery, you should be doing the surgery yourself in training. If you are a midwife, you should be doing delivery SWAT training. But if for years you are not doing any delivery and just teaching midwifery, then what you'll be doing is not teaching midwifery, but teaching something else. So at the end of the day, my last comment is that we don't really know what causes hypertension that's hypertensive disease in pregnancy. We don't know what causes it. We don't have a cure for it. 
So nobody can play champion here. All we are doing is that they are, we know just some few tricks of how to prevent or avoid death. So let's share those tips on how to prevent death uniformly so that we can all work together so that we don't fight and say these people are out of it. So all of us, we are in a, a field and we don't really know the best way forward. So let's support each other and find our way out. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Dr. Sofrano, I'm sure you have some comments to make. Uh, thank you. Yes, I do have. Um, my first comment has to do with uh, communication. Uh, somebody asked a question that we seem to be communicating but the people don't understand us and so for me uh, and then also the example i gave from my ward where after the doctor communicated the patient just packed her things and left all these are ample evidence that we are not communicating well with our clients there is a huge gap when it comes to communication uh, to our clients so for me one of the take home responsibility of the entire gathering. How can we improve on communication, on risk communication? When you determine the patient condition, how can we improve on the communication to the client so that the client will really understand that this is where I stand, this is what I have, and so on and so forth. For me, that is one of my take home messages. And the other take home message is that as has been reiterated all over the place today, this disease, this disease we are talking about that we don't know what causes it, there is more need for research into preeclampsia. There is more need for research. How can we prevent it? How can we detect it early? Even when it comes in the severe forms, what can we do to make sure that the woman survives? These are the two take home messages that I'm leaving with the house. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And His Lordship, you have the last word. Uh, thank you. I will repeat what I said in my guest uh, of honor speech, education, education, education. And thank God uh, this is type of education that APEC Ghana is doing. And also my second taking point is advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. So we thank uh, APEC Ghana for being a non-state actor doing some of these things. And my next point is effective communication. You know, effective communication. We can be talking, but sometimes we don't make sense like they've been, we've been made to know throughout the whole presentation. Effective, you know, communication. And then the fourth one is effective collaboration. There must be, we are talking about gaps, gaps, gaps. When the whole body has a seat here, you know, the whole body parts, where they all work differently, but they all work in synergy, you see? So there must be that effective collaboration. And then my, my fifth one, which is the last one, take away, we should push state actors to perform. They have the duty to protect us, you know? So I will wish the Minister of Health and the Ghana High Service, you know, you should all respect, you should up your game. You know, those statistics you know, should be guided to feed into action or responsive action. So uh, that would be my, I hope next time, uh, APEC Ghana, you involve the Office of Parliament. You know, you involve them. Of course, when I talk at the executive, the Minister of Health is here. You know, let them know, let the Minister of Health know what is really happening. The statistics that you, we are getting on the ground, you know, it's not good. You know, people are dying at the, at the time or in a, in a process that they should not die. But like I said, we live in a country where you know, we, don't, we don't complain. When you complain too much, they say, and so uh, that's it. So I repeat, education, education, education. Advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. And that's what APEC Ghana is doing. Effective communication. Let's change our style of communicating. And then effective collaboration. And then let the state duty, act, duty bearers, Minister of Health and Ghana High Service, up your game. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think uh, from, from the last uh, words that you've said, your, uh, His Lordship, uh, 
it, it brings me to the point, the question of stakeholder engagement. And I would like to challenge APEC uh, and its um, um, partners to um, work with the institutions, you know, to set up a stakeholder engagement process for uh, hypertensive disorders or pregnancy so that through that process, whatever the outcomes of those uh, discussions, they will help with a lot of what has been discussed here in terms of what each stakeholder group should be doing, be they religious, research and educational, uh, clinical practice, or you know, the policy makers, and then of course, uh, government. So all too soon, our time is up. And I would like to thank my uh, very able discussants here, Professor Ernestina Donko from UHAS, Dr. Chris Fofier from the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Emmanuel Sofranio uh, from the um, Medical Accra. Director, Greater Accra Regional Hospital, and His Lordship uh, Justice Gwedi, who is the uh, overseer of our judiciary system in the Volta and OT regions. And of course, you should also give yourselves a very big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate your patience and your engagement so far. We're going to take the closing remarks from our chairperson, Professor Harry Kwame Tagbo. And after that, we'll have the vote of thanks by Dr. Maxwell Dalaba Fellow from the Center for non communicable Diseases, Institute of Health Research, UHAS. Thank you. So, Professor Tagbo. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Now the day is over. You remember that song in primary school? Do you want to sing it? Are you sure? Okay, let's sing it. Thank you very much. Yeah, so we began the day with presentations from our guests and keynote speakers who set the tone for the symposium. Their presentations established that saving women with hypertensive disorders of pregnancy require more than medical, nursing, and midwifery knowledge and skill. It takes more than that to save the women and their babies. This was followed by the scientific presentations, which highlighted for us the concepts and theories underlining the disease the epidemiology, management, the policies and the protocols designed for managing the situation. We're also told about how the Ghana Health Service is responding to the situation, although they still have to do a bit more. Various researches that were already done and those that are still being done were also presented. We now know about the sports study, the respectful 
maternity care study. We also heard about the research going on at the whole teaching hospital. These are very important pieces of research and we believe that you've taken note of their findings. The participants, those of us in here and those online pose very intelligent questions which were all addressed satisfactorily. Clearly, as I sat here, I realized that we know so much about hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. However, it's still a big problem. We must translate the knowledge and expertise into uh, action. And that is what APEC stands for. We have learned today that hypertensive disorders of pregnancy is a medical problem but it is also a social problem due to the devastating social and cultural consequences on individuals and the society. Management of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy therefore requires um, an appreciation of the social and religious dimensions of the disease. But it's also important to note that our best efforts may be limited by whether the population perceive the disease as life-threatening and whether they believe our interventions are useful. So we should be careful how we present it to them. We must put extra efforts to engage the population more appropriately than we have done so far. We have to recognize everybody as a stakeholder. Some may influence our efforts negatively, but the majority, I believe, will back and promote our efforts. I therefore suggest that we begin to leverage on new technologies to educate ourselves and the rest of the population. Let us explore engaging the population through social media, which is the route they are used to these days. Let us explore putting messages relating to hypertensive disorders of pregnancy across in tweets, test messages, Facebook posts, etc. The bottom line is that we must connect with the public more than we have done before. And as his lordship said, we must engage, educate all the time. And so on behalf of the organizers, APEC Ghana and the partners and the sponsors of this symposium, I wish to thank all of you for your cooperation both in the hall here and those online, you have made this event a reality. I also sincerely thank our distinguished speakers for sharing their insights on the subject matter. I cannot leave the stage without thanking our amazing moderators, Dr. Muna and Dr. Koma. You did so well. Well done. And so distinguished speakers, participants, ladies and gentlemen, on that note, I thank you all very much for your cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much, the chair. In fact, the chair has already done all the thank yous, but I still need to do two more thank you to it. We want to thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, for sitting throughout this session. In fact, I really didn't believe that she will, he will sit from morning, from beginning to the end. Most often, big people like this, when you grab them, 
they only sit five minutes and disappear. But he sat from beginning to the end. Thank you so much. Yes, so I also like to thank the sponsors, APEC, Ghana, and Sport, particularly Mrs. Koiwa Mamaki. She's here. Let's see, Mamaki. Yes. Thank you so much for pushing for this program and choosing you as voter region for this program. We hope this time is not the first and the last. You are always welcome here. Thank you so much. Now to the participants, we are so grateful. Sitting from nine o'clock to four is not easy, especially if you are not a student. At this age, you will sit. You are forced to sit. You've not taken coffee, but you're forced from six, from nine to four o'clock. We are so grateful. Thank you so much. And our speakers, I want to thank you so much. You've done a marvelous work. In fact, initially when we're inviting the students, I said, how are they going to break these terminologies into simple terms so that the students and other people will understand? And they did this marvelously. I am so grateful. And you can see from there that the students were even able to ask questions, SS level. We are so happy for that. Thank you, uh, the speakers. Then the panelists too, so marvelous. The discussion went well. I logged on and I saw how the discussions were moving on. Even from the visual side, it was so great. Thank you so much for the wonderful work. Then the IT people, they did well, so well. Initially, I was afraid about it. When I saw the first presentation and the slides were like this, I couldn't see. I went visually, I couldn't see, I said, we are dead. However, we were able to rectify it and it all went so well. Thank you, IT, you did so well. Then the organizing team, it hasn't been easy for us. We have to be cranked and we also cranked ourselves and we're able to mobilize this to this end. We are so grateful for you, all the organizers, hi to you. And lastly, the students, they have done so well. They have done, we struggled to bring them here and they have come, if some of them have interacted well with them and they've expressed good knowledge, what they have acquired here. And I like the question the other guy asked, who killed the patient? Is it the nurse or the disease? In fact, it is good that we have the green, green people, the nurses here, you should take this, that a woman should not die out of pregnancy. It is very key. If you have that in mind, it shouldn't be the nurse that killed the woman, but the disease. And we are trying as much as possible not, the disease, not to let the disease kill anybody. As Professor said, the death of a woman or a child is not about the woman, but it's a household thing. When you go home, your wife or the woman is not happy, the whole household will what? Go away. So as much as possible, let's try and go and work well, work as change agents. And one of the panelists said, you cannot catch a madman alone. You need many people to catch a madman. Now we have been trained, we know, with others of knowledge, let's work as change agents to be able to address these complications in pregnancy. Thank you so much. Without much ado, please let's welcome Professor Evelyn Ansa to give us the closing prayer. Then we'll wrap up with some final comments. I know, I know. <laughs> then shall we rise? Shall we pray? Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us but to you be the glory for what you have done today. We thank you for the seed that you have sown in this place. And we look forward to this seed germinating and blossoming and bearing fruit across this country as we work together to solve the problem of 
hypertensive orders in pregnancy. We thank you for everyone that has come together to make this possible. We thank you for participants. We thank you for organizers. We thank you for students, oh God, who have spent all their day here. We ask, oh God, that as we part, that you, your spirit will not leave us, that you will go with each of us to our separate places, grant us journey mercies, and as we come together again, we will know that of a truth, you have done great things. We ask, oh God, that you help us, give us grace to carry many of the things we have done, we have discussed forward, so that it will yield what we expect it to yield. We thank you for your faithfulness, O oh God. In the name of your son, Jesus, we have prayed. Amen. Thank you. This has been a very engaging scientific session. Please, if you registered for CPD points, information will be sent to you as to how to get the CPD accreditation. If you didn't, we'll still send a message to everybody who registered for this so that you can sign up for the CPD. Lunch is going to be served in the basement. So please make your way to the basement when you leave here. Get Grab a pack before you go. We appreciate you and may the lunch nourish you well. Please, our speakers, let's go back to where we had our snacks and our lunch will be served there. Thank you. So finally, we want to once again uh, recognize the um, APEC Sport Sencord um, Rich Ministry of Health, Ghana Medical Dental Council, Nursing and Midwifery Council, Ghana Health Service, and the University of Health and Allied Sciences. Ayiko.